Well, hello everybody and welcome. We'll go ahead and get started. We'll start first with an invocation, which we observe with a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America thanks and before we take the role i just want to welcome everybody it's really wonderful not only to see but also hear um, a full room so welcome back to city hall all who have joined us today i'm clerk will you call the roll Bajan. here clegg here Allie burton here sanchez here Thompson, Here. Woodings, Here. all present. Thank you. Next up, we have the, a request for approval of the minutes from our budget workshop and regular meeting on June 22nd. Madam Mayor. Yes. I move approval of the minutes from our budget workshop and regular day meeting of June 22nd. Second. We have a motion, a second. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Allie Burton. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Woodings. Yes. Agent. Yes. Clegg. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. And now we have quite a few items under special business. First off is the reappointment of Jamie Bosiger to the airport commission for a three-year term. Jamie, are you here? Okay. No, Madam Mayor. Okay. All right. With that. Madam Mayor, um, I ask unanimous consent to reappoint Jamie Bosiger to the airport commission for a three-year term ending July 2024. Without objection. Um, I interviewed Jamie. She's been on the airport commission. She and I had a conversation. I really, she could well be flying right now. She's a pilot by trade and really appreciate her willingness to continue to serve as I know the commission and the director of the airport do. And next up, we have um, the appointment of John Stevens to the CCDC board for a five-year term. And John is with us this evening. I want to say thank you to John for his willingness to serve, um, to join this board and this item is before council now, and then you're welcome to come up. Madam Mayor, I ask unanimous consent to appoint John Stevens to the CCDC board for a five-year term ending June, 2026. Without objection. All right, John, um, I really appreciate your service. You're more than welcome to say a couple of things if you'd like, you don't have to. I didn't tell you about that in advance, but we appreciate you being here. <laughs> And that was it, you're confirmed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Madam uh, Mayor McLean and uh, council members, thank you for uh, the honor of doing this. I've lived in Boise for 19 years with my family and um, very excited to take part in the CCDC board and hope that my perspective and experience as a commercial real estate broker here uh, is valuable. And uh, I'm looking forward to being a part of the future of Boise. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Yes, thanks and welcome. And you're come, you're free to leave. Don't feel like you have to sneak away or you're <laughs> stuck here. You can just leave um, if you'd like. All right, next up we have revised findings for the appeal of PUD 21-6. And Cody is with us. Um, Madam Mayor, members of council, as you recall, this item it was heard by council on June 8th of this, this year. Um, at that time, you denied um, an appeal of a planned 270 unit planned unit development located at 2454 East Gowan Road. Uh, while no error was identified in the decision, you did find that the facts and evidence in the record uh, warranted additional conditions be placed on the project. Those were included in your packet uh, this evening, identified as conditions eight through 12. And with that addition, we are uh, recommending approval of the, the findings and conditions this evening. Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, I reviewed the um, new reason statement and the conditions uh, as presented and believe they accurately reflect the um, discussion and motion that night. And with that, I would move approval of PUD 21-6 findings and conditions of approval. Second. We have a motion and second. Motion and second. Is there any discussion? All right, clerk, will you call the roll? Holly Burton. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Woodings. Yes. Agent. Yes. Clegg. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. 
Thank you. And now we have Cody again with revised findings for CAR 21-12. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, as you recall, on June 15th of this year, uh, you did not, uh, council denied a rezone uh, request for approximately two acres located at 2801 uh, West Palouse Street. That request was to change the zoning from R1C or single family residential to a limited office zone uh, with design review. Uh, you did direct the applicant uh, to return with an alternative proposal uh, that is reflected in the reason statement for denial and we're recommending you approve uh, the reason statement this evening. Madam Thank Mayor, you. yes. Um, having been the maker of that motion, I would now move that we adopt the revised findings for CAR 21-12. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Madam Mayor, yes. just, just one comment. Um, in the reason statement, it does um, reference that this site was not um, appropriate for the higher residential density of that zone. However, I believe the Council found that evening that with the DA that was being proposed, it wasn't the residential density that was the issue. And um, I was not a maker of the motion. I did not um, vote in the affirmative, but would ask the maker of the motion if, if my analysis is correct. Madam Mayor, yes, I think that is correct. And um, I'm sorry that I didn't catch that in my analysis. I think that it was not an issue with the residential density, but that the zone did not provide that predictable pattern of development. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> with that, I guess I, I, I went ahead and seconded asking if we could strike the higher residential density in the reason statement. Yes, the maker of the motion concurs. Thank you. Any further discussion? Madam Mayor. Yeah. Well, I thought the reason should have been granted, but this is what all the rest of all y'all voted to do. And so um, I will support this reason statement. Burton, call the roll. Lee Burton. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Woodings. Yes. Agent. Yes. Clegg. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. And now we have motions from our budget workshop and follow up from Eric, who is joining us. Welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Last week, the city council held its second workshop on the fiscal year 22 proposed budget. During the workshop, the budget office presented details on the proposed budget and staff was available to answer any questions that the city council had. The next step in the budget approval process is to hold a, pu is to hold a public hearing, excuse me. That public hearing is scheduled for Tuesday, July 20th. The action before you today is consideration of the budget motions, which outline the budget that will be considered at the public hearing. The motions that were included in the agenda packet are consistent with the proposed budget that was released on June 18th with two notable exceptions. First, uh, the motions in the packet restore the city council strategic planning contingency account to $500,000 from the $225,000 that was included on page, 40, on page 84 of the document. The source for the increase would be the police and fire staffing plan adjustment that was included on page 53 of the proposed document. Further, the city council strategic planning contingency would be displayed as being available 50% for ongoing needs and 50% for one-time needs. Finally, the police and fire staffing study would be brought back for city council consideration via an interim budget change after the adoption of the budget and supported from the restored city council con contingency account. The second uh, item included in the packet uh, is signaling that an interim budget change would be brought forward after the adoption of the budget to advance adjustments related to animal license fees as discussed at last week's city council meeting. Costs associated with those adjustments would be supported from the ongoing city council strategic planning contingency line. And if in the course of evaluating the impacts from those changes, it is determined that costs exceed $50,000, the issue would return to the city council for additional discussion. At this time, I'd be happy to stand for any questions either on the motions or on any other items related to the fiscal year 22 proposed budget. Madam Mayor. Yep. 
Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Eric, thank you for that clarification. <clears throat> I just want to ensure that we do this correctly. Um, the motions that were published um, in the, with the agenda uh, did have the strategic planning contingency listed at 225,000 in number C5. And so as I make the motions, should I, should I first, I guess, preface all of the motions with a couple of amendments and then run through the total motions? And the first of those amendments would be to amend that to 500,000 as restated? Yeah, I think that would work. Okay. Thank you. And then secondly, um, the last motion right now is a bit confusing the way the, the, that it reads. Uh, motion G talks about both the change in the interim uh, in the city council strategic contingency and also talks about the other budgeted amounts. So I'd also like to offer an amendment where we split those two out and I'll um, offer G as the restatement of the city council contingency and then H as just everything else in, in the budget book. Is that also, uh, again, the appropriate way to do that? I, I believe it would, thank you. Okay, and if there's no other discussion, I'm prepared to make those amendments, the motions on the amendments now, if, if not, we can have the other discussion first. Okay, um, well, Madam Mayor, first I would move that we amend the motions for the budget as presented by uh, amending, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, C5 to read strategic planning contingency $500,000 as restated. And item G, um, sorry, I've got to find my language here. <laughs> that I offer an amendment that item G will now say motion to restate the city council strategic planning contingency account to $500,000 to allocate the 275,000 allocated to the police and fire staffing study on page 53 to the strategic city council strategic planning contingency and to state the intent to bring forward an interim budget change after the approval of the FY 2022 proposed budget to fund the police and fire staffing study from the city council strategic planning contingency and further to restate the city council strategic planning contingency as 250,000 for one-time purposes and 250,000 for ongoing purposes. And then with that, add uh, H, which will just be the first phrase in the proposed motion H, motion to refer all other budgeted items as presented for consideration at the public her hearing and set that for July 20th, 2021. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Madam Mayor, I talked with the council president for way too much of her time today about this motion because I, I didn't completely understand um, the way the motion was written and uh, the clarifications that the council president made, I think actually just say what the motion is intended to say all along, um, excuse me. And so uh, I very much support the amendments. All right, clerk, will you call the roll? Holly Burton. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Woodings. Yes. Agent. Yes. Clegg. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. Now, Madam Mayor. Yes. I would move uh, that the FY 2022 budget be moved to public hearing with the following motions A, 1, A through L, and 2 through 6, B, C, 1, A through G, and 2 through 5. D, uh, major equipment, 1 through 8. Major repair and maintenance, 9 through 12. Capital uh, for various departments, 13 through 35. Oh, excuse me, 13 through 40. <clears throat> I'm still missing that one capital items for various departments, 13 through 41, the airport fund, one through 27, the water renewal fund, one through 16, uh, motion E, motion F, the revised motion G, 
and the new motion H. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, I think just from a process perspective, I think it's important to note that this motion and what we're doing right now is moving this to a public hearing next month. And so I implore everyone who's interested in the city budget, interested in where we invest your tax dollars in our city to look at all of these budget motions and see if there's anything that you want to dive a little bit deeper into and share your thoughts with us. Um, it really has made a difference throughout my years on council to have people speak up. I think that we've had some neighborhood parks that kind of moved to the front of the line that were at the back of the line for amenities because we heard from folks and looked a little bit deeper at um, where we had some shortfalls and where we could reallocate some resources. So do look at the budget, do see if it reflects your values, see if we missed something in our various analyses um, and go ahead and share those thoughts with us in advance or at our public hearing next month. Madam Mayor, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just briefly um, wanted to um, thank everyone on the staff who worked so hard on this budget. Thank everyone in the public whose comments I did get. Um, I got a number of them. Certainly they were informative during the discussion at our budget, budget workshop uh, last week. And uh, as council member Whitting stated, um, welcome more of those if you have them. Just wanted to quickly explain the changes that were made tonight. Didn't change anything in the budget, just restated that in fact, the city council still does uh, carry forward a contingency fund in the same amount that has been ongoing for the years past, but that a certain amount of it will be spent on a police uh, and fire staffing study uh, directed by the city council and felt like it was really important to ensure that it came out of that city council budget. Uh, so we had this one step back on that staffing study. Um, so I really appreciate budget staff working uh, to clarify that so that it was, uh, I hope, more transparent for the public. Thank you. All right. With that, clerk, will you please call the roll? Holly Burton. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Woodings. Yes. Agent. Yes. Clay. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. Thank you. Next up, we have the consent agenda. All items with an asterisk are considered to be retained by the council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless a council member or citizen requests so requests, in which case the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered in its normal sequence. Madam Mayor, I move approval of the consent agenda as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Clerk, will you call the roll? Hallie Burton. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Woodings. Yes. Beechant. Yes. Clegg. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. And next up, we're moving into ordinances. We have two ordinances on first reading. Madam Mayor, I ask unanimous consent that all ordinances on first reading be read by number and title only and filed for the second reading calendar. Without objection. ORD-33-21, an ordinance CAR 21-00007 for property located at 2222 South Broadway Avenue. Amending zoning classifications of the city of Boise City to change the classification of real property particularly described in section one of this ordinance and adjacent rights of way from R-1C, single family residential to C-1D, neighborhood commercial with design review setting forth a reasoned statement in support of such zone change and provide an effective date. ORD-34-21, an ordinance CAR 20-00021, for properly located at 3153 West Hawthorne Drive and 4306 West Taft Street, amending zoning classifications of the city of Boise City to change the classification of real property to particularly described in section one of this ordinance from R-1AS, single family residential with Sycamore neighborhood overlay, to R-1CSDA, single family residential with Sycamore neighborhood overlay and development agreement, setting forth a reason statement in support of such zone change and providing an effective date. Thank you. 
We have nothing on second or third reading, but we have one ordinance on first, second, and third reading. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, bef before I um, make the first motion, I'll note that I uh, expect we will have discussion after the ordinance is read and before we vote on it. And also note that um, due to the time limitations um, in ensuring that we can meet the requirements in HB 413, we were unable to have the public process that we anticipated with this, but will in fact, the ordinance requires us to have that public process uh, when the new census numbers are out and um, before the election in 2023. And with that, I would move that all rules of the council interfering with the immediate consideration of ordinance 3521 be suspended that the portions of Idaho code 50902 requiring an ordinance to be read on three different days, twice by title and once in full be dispensed with. And the records show that it has been read for the third time in full. Second. We have a motion and a second. Clerk, we call the roll. Allie Burton. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Woodings. Yes. Agent. Yes. Clegg. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. ORD-35-21, an ordinance adopting the city council seat district map attached here to as exhibit A, providing memo and accompanying figures one through seven setting forth methodology used to create city council seat district map attached here to as exhibit B, adopts new city council seat numbers, amending Boise city code section 1-9-1 to add Idaho code reference, amending Boise city code section 1-9-4B, to provide for city council seat numbers to align with district numbers, adding a new Boise City Code Section 1-9-4C to create city council seat districts and renumbering the subsequent sections, amending Boise City Code Section 1-4- excuse me, 1-9-4C to provide for city council member terms other than four years, adding a new Section 5 to Boise City Code Title 1, Chapter 9, which establishes city council districts and requirements, provides for district boundary updates, provides for candidacy for city council seat district, and establishes procedures for city to transition to city council elections by districts, providing for a waiver of the reading rules, approving the summary of the ordinance, and provide an effective date. Madam Mayor. Yes. I move approval of ordinance 3521. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, I'll go ahead and kick off, I'm sure, the long string of thoughts that people have. Um, so it was my hope that we were going to have a process that um, was going to really include the public and have so much opportunity for the citizens of Boise to show us what they wanted. This districting conversation is something that has been handed to us by the legislature. It was not our choice. Um, we had conversations with the legislators who sponsored the legislation saying, hey, let us have this conversation as a city first and see how residents of Boise would like to be represented um, by their members of council. And they did not want that to happen. They wanted us to district in this way and they passed legislation to force us to do that. We worked very hard over the past year on some follow-up legislation that would have allowed us to take a little bit more time and district after our 2020 census results are in. And that legislation did not successfully um, make it through both bodies based on, um, based on some amendments that were not um, in the spirit of the original legislation. So that got us to where we are today, um, a process that was incredibly truncated where we had to rely on experts. We didn't have a community conversation about it. Um, and that was not what we wanted at all. At the same time, we didn't want to waste, you know, a lot of taxpayer money. I don't even know what the consultant um, is going to end up costing us on this, but we didn't want to waste that amount of money districting and then not actually having to district until 2023. And so we waited to see if that legislation would pass so that we would be able to then have a process 
But then when we weren't able to, we needed to go ahead and hire a consultant to help us do this. Um, it was not ideal. It's not the way that any of us wanted this to happen, but here we are today. Um, and my hope is, and um, I will work as hard as I possibly can to ensure that our 2023 district maps have a full community process, that the citizens of Boise are um, fully vested in um, ensuring that those reflect our community to the highest extent possible. There are many, um, many different processes and models to look at when it comes to drawing um, political boundaries and we can follow best practices to ensure that um, that's something that's open and um, accountable to our citizens. So um, while I didn't support districting in the first place, here we are. Um, I supported the process as led by Council President Clegg, who really stepped up to make sure that this, um, this was as good as it could be. And um, so here we are today, and I'll be supporting this ordinance because it keeps us in line with Idaho statute, um, make sure that we're not getting sideways with the laws that govern our state and um, puts us in the place that we need to be to hold elections in 2021. Madam Mayor. Um, um, President, and then my thank you. So um, as council member Wooding stated, um, this was not a place where frankly any of us wanted to be. I would have much preferred to have a conversation with the community um, about districts and how, uh, if, but particularly how uh, to implement them. I think the legislation as passed gives us uh, really very few choices. Um, and given the, uh, recognized district principles uh, that have been vetted through the Supreme Court in the United States. We um, had pretty strict uh, rules to follow in terms of how to do this as well. Um, I was the chosen to represent the council. I am not running this year. I would not have been up regardless of what happened. Um, and I have a lot of experience with uh, these kinds of things. And so the council asked if I would represent them so that it could be as unbiased as possible, but that the community still had a representative looking at it. Uh, we worked with some experts. Those experts um, used the precinct maps that the county provided. We determined that really our biggest communities of interest in the city of Boise are our neighborhood associations. And so to the extent we could, uh, these districts represent um, those neighborhoods associations as whole. Unfortunately, we weren't able to achieve population balance, which is another requirement and keep all of them whole. Um, however, even the ones that were um, necessarily split, uh, it's my estimation given the information that was shared with us by the experts uh, that the communities of interest are still represented fairly within those splits. The other um, piece of this that we had to recognize was, um, or that, that we wanted to recognize, frankly, districting principles would have allowed us to, to um, draw very odd shaped districts. It happens all over the country, um, but we made it very clear to the consultants that it was our intent to keep geographically contiguous districts to the extent we could. Um, we've got some odd things happening uh, geographically in Boise. We've got the river, we've got Garden City uh, splitting, we've got the foothills, we've got the benches. And so um, given all of that, we kept these districts as geographically contiguous and coherent as was possible and still balance the population and recognize the communities of interest in the neighborhood associations. It's not perfect. Um, I, will, I know that that's the case. However, I also know having worked on this that uh, it's quite good. In fact, the experts told us, um, I was quite surprised, frankly, the experts stated to us that they didn't usually have elected officials or representatives of elected officials who were willing to draw districts that were simply based on those districting principles and not based on uh, other things like incumbency. 
However, incumbency is something that you can recognize. Had this law not passed, um, three people would have been up for election this year. And while we didn't number the districts based on where those people live, as it turned out, based on the geography, um, those three people are in separate districts. And so we did make an accommodation, which is not only allowed, but actually um, preferred under law to, allow, to um, give those incumbents a chance to run this year. However, those seats are for two years. And in two years after the 2020 census numbers are released, after we have a public process, all six city council district seats will be up for election. The other three will be for two years at that point so that we can reestablish a staggered four year, four year, um, three and three terms uh, within the districts. Again, um, certainly not perfection, but certainly uh, from my understanding, uh, from the experts, from the, my commitment to doing this, I told the sponsor of this bill that although I didn't support the bill, I didn't agree it was the right way to do this, my job at this point was to uphold the law in the very best unbiased ethical way I could. And I feel good that that's the outcome of this. I know not everyone will agree. I know not everyone will like these, but we are at a point where we can have an election this year. We will not create due process um, issues with the three people who do get elected this year because they will have two year terms, not four year terms. And in four years, all six city council districts can be up for election. Uh, I believe that the citizens of Boise have uh, in the past chosen representatives that were very representative. I'm confident that the citizens of Boise going forward will do the same thing. And I look forward to Boise continuing to be a well-governed city and not one that's governed by uh, small issues or divisive issues, but one that's governed by people who want this city to be the best city it can be for everyone. Uh, which is the mayor's uh, fondest wish as, as we look at the um, values that we put forward. And so for all of those reasons, um, I believe that we have presented an ordinance and a map that will move us forward in the best way that we could have found in this short time frame, given the uh, rules that were imposed on us by another legislative body. Thank you. Madam Mayor. <clears throat> um, so much has been said already that I just 100% agree with. And so I'm gonna try to keep this as, as brief as I can. Um, I do wanna thank uh, Council President Clegg and the folks who worked on putting this together. I think given the ingredients that we had to work with and the short time that our legislature gave us, um, this really is about the best that we can get. And like Council President Clegg said, it's not perfect, but I do think that it is good. And we do have an opportunity in the future when we get our next census information to look at it again. Um, when I ran in 2019, um, along with Council Member Bajit and Council President Clegg, this was an issue that was popping up at several different discussions. And all three of us committed to having this conversation with the community um, and to addressing it. And I truly believe that our most powerful and important tool that we have is our ability to vote and for the community to not have the ability to be part of that discussion, I think is, is, is really a bummer for lack of a better term. It's, it's terrible that you all didn't have the ability to decide how you wanted to vote for future city council members. And this decision was made for you. Um, I don't know if I think that districts are a good thing or a bad thing. You know. That's, that's not really for me to decide. It's my uh, job up here to listen to you all, to get your input and to do the best that I can to represent your voices. And there are certainly some people who really wanted districts and there were other people who didn't. I think that we're gonna get to this next election. I think that there's gonna be people who go to the polls and they're gonna be surprised that they don't get a vote for a city council member um, this year. I think that there's going to be other people who are really excited to maybe have a city council member running um, a little bit closer to maybe where they live. And so, again, while I think it's 
really unfortunate that we weren't able to put this decision more in your hands um, to make sure that your voices were heard. I think that we are doing the best that we can with what we've got to move forward with this. And now I'm interested to see where it would go. And I hope that uh, the people in Boise, you know, continue to show up to vote and make sure that they're represented the best that they can. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Council President Clegg, for your work on this and uh, uh, for taking into consideration the folks who are running this year and how this would affect us. Um, I ran for office because I felt called by God to do it. And um, if you look at my resume, it shows that I didn't take the mark, didn't mark the boxes that were clearly setting me up to run for office someday. And, um, but along the way, uh, we made history with my campaign. Um, Boise made history. Uh, Boise elected its first Latina to city council. I belong to one of the largest minority groups in our state. And I'm not 100% sure, I may be the first renter to serve on council as well. So when we talk about representation, it's not just about geography, it's about the way you move through this world. And um, I think it's important that we have people from different walks of life sitting up here, uh, being a part of the decision-making processes that when it comes down to it, affect the most vulnerable members of our community the most harshest. And if we don't have people like that at the table, um, it's difficult for decision makers to make those decisions that are gonna take those uh, people in mind. Um, for example, I was the only person to vote against uh, the parking ordinance amendment that we made for one very important reason. And that is because I am somebody who has over the past 10 or 12 years flirted with homelessness. So I know what that's like. And I bring that perspective to the table. I'm also very naive when it comes to politics. Um, sometimes when you don't know the limitations, it's what gives you uh, the impetus to jump. If I'd known that typically people who run for office have a lot of resources, they have a lot of money, they have a lot of important contacts in the community, um, they, they have a lot to support them moving forward. Uh, I did not have that. Um, so for me, it's, it's, it's a miracle <laughs> that I'm sitting here amongst these folks. But I also think it's important that someone like me be here. And I think a big part of what made it possible was being able to run as an at-large member. I was able to pull from all over the city, which means that anybody prior to the passage of this law and now this ordinance, um, anybody who felt compelled that they had something to offer our citizens as a member of the Boise City Council, as long as they were within the city limits of Boise, Idaho, as long as they met all the other requirements to run for office, they could have. Uh, there's nothing special about uh, the fact that a, a number of us are, are located in, in, in a similar part of the city. I do live in the North End, but I'm a renter. I've rented for nine years. Um, it's a different experience to rent. I think these days uh, we can certainly see that. Um, and I bring that perspective to my work. So the work that I've done for the past four years has not been about living in the North End. It's been about being a renter. It's been about somebody who is a member of the working poor. It's been about being somebody who comes from a community of color. Uh, that's what I bring to the decision-making process. My worry is that with this districting that we're gonna be adopting, is it's gonna make it harder for us to have a diverse uh, perspective sitting at this dais. Um, and sitting at this dais is only part of, part of the work. There are meetings that happen that people need to be a part of, that people need to give their lived experiences. Because I don't think that people get up in the morning wondering how they can make life hard for another individual. It's ignorance. People don't know what other people are going through unless we have those very people sitting at the table. My fear is that with having districts, it's gonna make it that much harder. It took spit, bubble gum, scotch tape, and staples for me to be up here. 
I hope to God I'm going to be able to have another term where I will be able to, again, advocate for those folks who don't have a voice. I think the loudest voices uh, for districting, they were people who already have privilege. Um, people who don't have privilege, quite honestly, don't have time. They don't have the resources. Um, they don't have the channels here. Except for the past four years, they did with me. And I'm hoping that that will continue. Um, but I'm also used to having to deal in a system that wasn't built for my success, that wasn't built uh, for me to be a part of. So I will give it my all. And so welcome to districts in the city of Boise. Madam Mayor, I just wanna add one point that I think uh, didn't get touched upon. I appreciate the, my colleagues telling the story about how we got here very accurately. And also want to uh, thank Councilmember Clegg for taking the lead on this um, and doing an outstanding job. I, I was only gonna add that uh, by no means does do the these districts set a precedent for what the districts could look like next year. Uh, and the that's going to involve all of you and your thoughts and um, a completely different uh, set of population figures uh, that are a decade later, uh, 10 years later. And I. Uh, um, while I won't be here, my district is up uh, this year and I've, I won't be seeking a fourth term, but I trust my colleagues are going to do an outstanding job as they always do to integrate the thoughts of all of you um, in making up those new districts uh, that will last for another 10 years. So thank you. All right, with that, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Allie Burton. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Thompson? Yes. Woodings? Yes. Agent? Yes. Clegg? Yes. All in favor, motion carries. Thank you. Okay, now we are moving into new business, subdivisions, and a public hearing. So we've got first up SUV 21 9. And Kevin is here for the city. We've got Todd Tucker. And is he? Is Heath here? Too? Oh, there you are. Hello. And then Barber Valley. Is it Gary VC or John Mooney? Are you? Not for the Neighborhood Association, though. <laughs> is the Neighborhood Association online? Yes, Madam okay. Mayor. So we're in this hybrid mode now. So we'll be working both um, through the room for people that are here that want to testify, but also still with Zoom. That's why I'm checking on this. So I had one person sign up in advance. I believe to be online. Is that Teja or Teja? Yes, Madam Mayor, she's online. Okay, great. So we have one person online. And then if there are others online, just raise your Zoom hand throughout the hearing and we'll be sure to call on you. And then I also have a list of several people that signed up in advance that I'll call through. And then if I haven't called your name, either here in person or online, just let us know and, and we'll work through everybody. Great, with that, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, before you is a request for a preliminary plat comprised of 59 buildable lots and one common lot on 115 acres located at 3201 South Cal Council Springs Road in the Harris Ranch specific plan or SPL1 zone. Um, the property highlighted here is located on the eastern edge of the Harris Ranch specific plan area and includes that first ridge line of foothills overlooking the valley. Uh, properties to the north and east are owned by the Idaho Department of Fish and Game as a wildlife management area. And uh, Harris Ranch North is to the northeast and the Peace Valley Overlook Reserve owned by the city is to the southeast. Um, as I'm sure you all know, the Harris Ranch specific plan or SB01 was adopted back in 2007 and included this land use map you see here on the left. Um, two areas shown there in brown were identified as residential foothills developments. Um, so the Harris Ranch North subdivision and this property. Uh, with SB01, up to 350 residential lots were envisioned for these two areas. And then in uh, 2015, the Harris Ranch North subdivision was platted with 173 of those lots. Um, and with tonight's application, an additional 59 lots are proposed. The design of the subdivision itself has been dictated by the only access point available at the end of Council Springs Road and the topography of the property itself. The applicant is proposing a local road which follows the backside of the ridgeline, allowing the majority of the lots to have backyards facing the valley. 
This layout is also the product of many conversations with the fire department, and they have confirmed that this design will function for their emergency access requirements. In their hearing back in May, the Planning and Zoning Commission approved of a Category 3 hillside permit for the grading associated with the proposed subdivision. Um, I won't spend too, many, too much time going over those details, but it is worth noting that the applicant is planning to grade uh, all the individual path Hello, sites can you hear me? in time to better integrate the drainage and condense the time frames related to the grain, drain, grading work itself. Uh, this should result in pads which are terraced up the hillside, generally following the contour of the ridge line. Uh, for the most part, the ridge line itself is being minimally altered as the road and pad sites are set back a ways. <laughs> and the applicant has provided additional documentation confirming that the amount of cut and fill performed on site uh, will balance, which should ultimately result in less truck traffic. Uh, one thing to note is that as part of this application, a new trail connection is being proposed, shown here on the right, which would connect the existing Homestead Trail at the end of Council Springs Road to the city-owned Peace Valley Overlook Reserve to the south. Uh, the Parks Department and our Ridged Rivers folks are working with the applicant right now on, on designing a sustainable route, which would become part of the Ridged River system. The applicant would construct the trail itself once a route has been finalized. Uh, parking for these trails would be located at the base of the subdivision along Council Springs, where roughly 26 spaces, shown in green, fit along both sides of the road. Uh, no parking would be allowed in the areas highlighted in red, including past the entrance of the subdivision, to allow for sufficient turnaround space for trail users. Um, so on that topic of the, the turnaround, there has been some very recent discussions about other possible options for what this turnaround area could look like. Um, at this point in time, nothing really has been nailed down, but we are following up with ACHD, our parks team, uh, the Barber Valley Neighborhood Association, and the fire department on other possible configurations. And, uh, you know, if there is a better alternative that could be found, uh, we could finalize that design prior to final, the final plat. One other item worth noting is that the existing on-street parking further south down Council Springs will remain with a sidewalk along the east, east side of the road connecting to the trailheads. And so uh, ACHD and the Parks Department have both approved of these designs. So in conclusion, the Planning and Zoning Commission found that the applicant's proposal was consistent with the standards of approval, including the Development Code, Blueprint Boise, the Harris Ranch specific plan, and all requirements of the reviewing, reviewing agencies and departments. Um, so therefore they recommended approval of the applications. So with that, I'm happy to stand for any questions. And then we also do have Melissa Janish from Public Works available if there's any technical questions related to the hillside. Thank you. All right, any questions before we move on to the applicant? Are you looking for another slide or are you? No, I, I apologize. Looks like I pulled up the, the wrong slide deck there. Hopefully you guys were able to, to follow along or, or just let me know if you have any questions. All right, looks good. Okay, we'll go ahead and you all can come up. Hi, Madam Mayor, uh, uh, City Council. Um, over 15 years ago, we uh, established a mission statement at Harris Ranch to, in a timely manner, to profitably sell the assets of Harris Ranch in a professional and business-like atmos atmosphere demonstrative of the owner's commitment to the environment, the community, and the heritage. Uh, we think we've gotten off to uh, a good start the last 15 years, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, it was the city's first uh, specific district ordinance. The uh, short way to get to it is uh, there used to be 22 chapters. Uh, we're chapter 23. Um, when uh, we started in, uh, 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 in 2006, 2005, um, which the next slide you'll see, was what was originally on the drawing board. Um, and as you can see, the... Um, the development in the foothills went all the way up to Wild Horse. Um, we, uh, we got a bunch of people together. We got the Southeast Neighborhood Association, the East End Neighborhood Association, uh, ICL. 
we had about 70 people and we did uh, charrette for four days and four evenings. A month later, did it for two days and two evenings. And then we did it every month after that until we submitted the plan. It was unanimously approved by the city council. Um, and uh, we were given a standing ovation by the city council at the time, uh, not just for the project, but for the process we went through. Out of that came the next slide, which is uh, SP01 that uh, you uh, uh, looked at earlier. Um, uh, that clustered the development uh, down uh, lower in the foothills and uh, resulting in uh, an allowed 350 single family residential lots. So far, we've used 172 of that allotment. Today, we're asking for another 59. Last year, our certified uh, assessed valuation was at $348 million uh, in Harris Ranch. Um, as yet to be a certified assessed value, this year has gone up to $489 million. We have over 900 multifamily units in escrow, and the Harris Ranch Wildlife Mitigation Plan, a 501c3, is in full swing. Our de facto partnership in Bar Barber Valley has gone beyond the requirements of SP01 and making Barber Valley a special place to be and protect. You'll hear more about that later. Fortunately, the Harris family believed in the economics of amenities plan that if you protect the amenities that are bringing people to your community, your values won't be just sustained, they'll be enhanced. Um, has this plan been perfect? No. Uh, we've omitted it from time to time, but we have stayed the course on the core values of the plan. Um, is it perfect? No, it's not. Is everybody happy all the time? No, they're not. But all in all, it's uh, been a good de facto partnership with the Barber Valley neighborhood and the Harris family and the community at large. And now I will give you Heath Clark. Thanks, Doug. Heath Clark, 251 East Front Street in Boise. Um, so Doug's giving you a little bit of context about where we've come from. I'm going to set this up a little bit procedurally here for everyone. So as, as has been mentioned repeatedly, this is part of the Harris Ranch specific plan. Uh, it's Kevin, next slide, if you would. Uh, of course, that's section 11-0301 of Boise City Code. And as Doug has mentioned, we've this is something that's been vetted over the course of many years. When I'm feeling really melodramatic, I'll bring in the giant volume one and volume two binders and plop them down here so everybody can see. But um, all of that work led to uh, approvals of the densities, uses, street sections, and unit counts throughout um, the, the what we now know as Harris Ranch. Let's go to the next one. So again, that, now that comes to the question of what's uh, before us tonight. Uh, as has been mentioned, Harris North was done a few years ago. That's the area on the left. And what we're talking about is Harris East on the right. And uh, I just pointing out the, the comment as to what densities are still available in SP01. You can see the, the 350 units that were originally approved for the Foothills area. Um, so in terms of where we are with the, these applications, as Kevin mentioned, the, the category three hillside permits already been approved. That means that we've gone through the engineering analysis. They've determined that the site itself, so being the foothills, this is an area of particular concern. We want to make sure that the site can actually handle the development that's been proposed. So the, that analysis has been done with, with the Public Works Department. And the Planning and Zoning Commission has approved that. So now we're here at the, pre, at the pre, uh, preliminary plat. And the question for us is whether this is in conformance with SP01. And as we work through this, the densities, the location of the development, all of this is consistent with what was uh, approved in 2007. Um, we've worked through each of the agency comments, um, including ACHD and the fire department. Uh, one thing I would note that I think will be of, of use as we continue the conversation tonight is that there's a fire safety plan that is required in connection with all of this. Uh, you have in your packet the letter from the from the fire department indicating that they're going to continue to work with us and that, that has to be completed as per usual prior to the final plat. But there is a draft fire safety plan there uh, for everyone to see. Um, 
this is I've got this a little bit out of order because I'm here talking to you about conclusions and we are in agreement with the terms and conditions of the staff report but Todd Tucker our planner is next going to talk to you about why and how we got there and all of the the neighborhood conversations that led us to that point so I'm going to turn it over to Todd and then we'll wrap it up Thank you, Heath. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council, my name is Todd Tucker. I represent Boise Hunter Homes. Our business address is 729 South Bridgeway Place in Eagle, Idaho. Okay, well, next slide. Uh, so as you can see, the project overview, um, uh, we've, we've gone over it uh, before, but just restate, 59 units on 119 acres, a uh, little bit over half a dwelling unit an acre. Uh, we're only developing approximately 19% of the site and leaving 93 acres as open space. We're not requesting any waivers uh, of any of the standards and the, la the, out uh, the layout, sorry, is, is uh, in conformance with the proposed specific plan. Again, we had a, a hillside permit that was approved by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, we went through, you know, extensive review process on, on that. Uh, and, uh, and per the staff, the, the land is capable of the volume and type of development proposed for, uh, for this subdivision. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but just I uh, wanted to show, you know, we've been at this for a, almost a year now, meeting with uh, public agencies, uh, city staff, uh, various uh, departments within the city and, and uh, governmental agencies, uh, the neighborhood association and residents in the area uh, to, to end up with uh, the product that we have uh, before you tonight. Uh, a few comments from uh, Barber Valley Neighborhood Association I wanted to, to address. Uh, first of all, we wanted to thank the th thank the BVNA for their uh, their recommendation of approval. As you know, that doesn't happen too terribly often, um, and we're we're grateful for uh, for their support of this project. Uh, their letter of recommendation did uh, come with a couple of uh, additional suggestions, and I wanted to run through those quickly for you now. As far as trailhead parking. Uh, we understand the neighborhood's uh, desire for trailhead parking in this area. We simply don't have the room to accommodate a full parking lot, but we do have a solution uh, that we think is, is, uh, is beneficial to the area. We've designed the extension of Council Springs Road to be wide enough to accommodate on-street parking on both sides of the road. And we estimate we can, we can fit uh, approximately 26 vehicles uh, in, this, in this area. We showed this to the Parks Department and they, uh, they seem to, to like this option. In addition, we understand the Neighborhood Association's desire for a turnaround at the northern end of Council Springs Road. We had an engineer lay out a modified intersection uh, where Prominence Road intersects with Council Springs Road. Uh, it's, 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 it's basically a, a cul-de-sac. It makes all the dimensions of a cul-de-sac. However, Prominence extends off of that. I did send this to, to ACHD to see what their thoughts were um, after uh, their, their uh, department uh, discussed it. Uh, they they re, you know returned with an answer that they they couldn't support it at this time. Um, however, we we've committed to the neighborhood association to continue to work with them and to go to uh, to ACHD uh, to continue to work on this this item and hopefully find a solution. Uh, we wanted to show the, you this potential solution tonight so that you're aware that we're continuing to work with the neighborhood association and ACHD uh, to come up to it with a solution. We just wanted to make sure that uh, if, if the project is approved tonight as is, that we didn't need to come back before the city council uh, for a modification to this plat as we, if we do get ACHD to sign off on uh, a modified intersection here that would allow for a turnaround so that residents don't have to drive up into the subdivision to turn around. We as a developer don't have an issue with it, we're fine if people drive up into the subdivision to turn around, but we understand the neighborhood's concerns. Next slide. Uh, as you know from the written correspondence and the minutes of the Planning and Zoning Commission hearing, there are four homes that back onto the extension of Council Springs Road. Uh, there were uh, We were conditioned by the Planning and Zoning Commission to formulate a solution, uh, which we're happy to uh, announce that we, we had several meetings with the neighbors uh, that were affected, and we provided them with a solution that they are all pleased with. We think, it, uh, we think it's a good solution. It will work to, uh, to provide a, a barrier or a berm um, for both light and sound from those neighbors' uh, rear yards, and we think it will add a nice uh, entry road uh, amenity to the subdivision as well. Madam Mayor, time. Um, as far as hillside restoration goes, 
Um, we will be revegetating re the site uh, as required by the code. The neighborhood association wants us to revegetate the entire uh, the entire slope. We don't think that that's really prudent to have people walking on the slopes that that are that steep um, to revegetate it. Whoa. <laughs> we, your balloons are popping. That, uh, that was the that was the second signal that you've gone over your time. Okay. <laughs> the, um, um, yeah. If you would wrap up the sentence on this, I'm gonna yeah. ask that we move ahead. Yeah. So we're we're just wanted to let you know we're we're committed to uh, to um, the foothills and restoring, and we have you know we're part of the the, the wildlife mitigation fund as far as Harris Ranch. We're committed to continuing to participate in that. We just don't think it's prudent to uh, to restore the entire slope, the ones that were not disturbing. We went to great measures to not disturb a great portion of the slopes. We will revegetate those that uh, are required and that were disturbing, but uh, we don't think it's wise to revegetate the entire the entire slope. With that, thanks. Uh, if our time's up, we're any, yep. we're any quite. I'll see if anybody has questions before we lose you, Madam Mayor. Um, I had a question about that proposed intersection design. So Council Springs Road isn't because right now it looks like it's just kind of stubbed off. Um, or is is this an existing road or is this a road that is still to be built? Sure, Madam Mayor, Council Member uh, Woodings. So Council Springs Road ends right now as a public right of way and the Homestead Trail continues on oh, the okay. end of it. We will be extending Council Springs Road past where the gate is, where it ends now, up to the entrance uh, where prominence extends into the subdivision. So we'll be, we'll be extending Council Springs Road from where it ends right now uh, as a public, public right of way. So um, just to follow up, Madam Mayor, um, so you're proposing originally that it was just going to be stubbed. So there's no plan to need to extend that even further. And so you're able to propose this alternate um, intersection. Madam Mayor, Council Member Woodings. Yeah, so, so as you see on the exhibit, what you see in black, those lines, that's what's on the preliminary plot. Mm -hmm. um, ACHD, uh, it meets their standards, they're okay with it. Planning Commission was okay with it. The planning staff is okay with it. Uh, fire department, police, everyone is fine with that configuration. The Neighborhood Association just has concerns that since uh, there will be on-street parking on Council Springs Road, that those residents, once they drive down there, won't have a, a way to turn around on Council Springs Road to get back out. They'll have to drive up into the subdivision. And so we're just trying to provide a solution to satisfy the neighborhood association that has a concern about vehicles turning around on Council Springs Road and not heading into the subdivision. Right now, it's a it's a hammerhead uh, that meets the fire department's standards. So you could pull okay. straight back and then and turn around within it now, we're just trying to make it a little bit easier for people to, to turn around there. Okay, so that was for fire department access, is it, it wasn't for future expansion of the road. All right, thank you. That's what I needed to know. Any other questions? Madam Mayor, um, I wanna preface this by uh, saying that I'm not advocating for more housing in the foothills, but my question is, so there was originally 350 spots approved, North got 173, there's 59 going into east. So there's about 118 units left over of what was originally approved for the plan. And so I'm just kind of curious, is the decision for less housing, does it have to do with the amount of space that's developable? Is it, is it the choice to have 93 acres of open space? Is it a decision to have larger houses instead of smaller houses? What's the um, decision to do fewer houses than what would be allowed in the area? Sure, Madam Mayor. Uh, Council Member Halliburton. There are several things went into it. Uh, we we do uh, support open space, so we like that we're able to provide quite a bit of open space in the area. We like the size of lots, uh, being able to provide larger lots. Um, one of the one of the to be honest, one of the driving factors is access. We only have one access into this site. We looked at numerous different options to get other access in and out, and we we just couldn't find one. We're, we're, you know, we're bounded on the, the north and the east by uh, public lands. The city owns a piece of ground to the south. Uh, there just wasn't another way to get another secondary access out of there. And so with the fire department standards, we're limited to 59 lots. 
because we have one point of access. These homes will be fire sprinklered. It meets the, the, the fire code that was recently adopted in, in January of, of this year. Uh, and so that was one of the driving factors of why the, the, the lot count is low, uh, is really fire department access. However, we see it as an amenity. We think these are gonna be great lots. We love that we are able to preserve this much open space uh, and area for, for a trail connection. We just think it's uh, great. So it kind of worked out into our advantage um, we would have probably liked to put a few more lots on there, but but just because of the the restrictions of the fire department and access, we're stuck with 59. All right, it looks like that's it for now. Thanks, Dad. So we will now move on to the neighborhood association. I think they're online, and we'll be able to see you in a minute. We see you, Gary. Great. Madam Mayor and members of the council, uh, my name is Gary Vesey. My address is 4150 Macbeth in Boise. Tonight I am representing the Barber Valley Neighborhood Association and its members. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you tonight. And as an aside, thank you for all of your dedicated, dedicated and often difficult work to represent our neighbors and our city. As a means of background, the Barber Valley Neighborhood Association has been working closely with Todd Tucker of Boise Hunter Homes since December of, of last year to understand and evaluate the development proposal for Harris East. Additionally, we have engaged with Doug Fowler from Lanier, members of your planning staff, Foothills and Open Space staff, Transportation Planning staff, and ACHD. We have shared project updates with our neighbors at monthly meetings since January and have been working with a handful of residents about their concerns since then, but it has been pretty minimal. Uh, we provided written and verbal testimony to B&Z in support of the project with suggested conditions that address concerns that we had about the project at that time. Since PNZ um, made their recommendation to council, BVNA has continued to be in contact with the developer. Some of our previous concerns were satisfied by responses by the staff or developer at the PNZ hearing. And some have been determined to have engineering or cost challenges, uh, such as a parking lot at the Homestead Trailhead. Cutting to the chase, BVNA supports this application. Our support is based on it being in compliance with SP01. It meets previous entitlements for development in the foothills and will allow for an exciting connection of Peace, Peace Valley Overlook to the Homestead Trail that we are very excited about. Despite these benefits, we continue to have several small concerns that warrant your consideration. I should note that we provided the council with written testimony addressing just three issues um, that Todd mentioned earlier. I will take those a bit out of order from our letter for ease of presentation. The first was re with regard to the headlight and privacy impacts on four Spring Creek neighbors. BVNA Pre previously testified that this impact must be addressed and PNZ conditioned the project to mitigate these impacts. We are very pleased to learn and uh, personally confirm with one of the affected neighbors that they have resolved this issue, working with Doug Fowler, given that the solution will take place on a sliver of Harris family property. Bravo for hands-on collaboration to resolve these concerns satisfactorily. The second item was the hillside restoration and elimination of noxious and invasive weeds. BVNA recommended a condition for the developer to collaborate with the adjoining triplet ranch HOA, HOA, excuse me, as well as Angela Rossman and her board at Harris Ranch Wildlife Mitigation Association. The HOA has started to restore the hillside above their homes, uh, which is the hillside beneath and contiguous with Harris East to reduce wildlife risk at their own expense. We believe Boise Hunter Homes should be required to restore the portions of their property above the above triplet and below the Harris East homes, 
but not certainly not their entire property to restore the hillside to native vegetation. Otherwise, Triplet Ranch's efforts will be wasted. This would be in addition to the required revegetation of areas of uh, where earthwork took place, which is currently a, a condition. We feel developers should improve and restore their parcel for the benefit of the greater community to reduce the potential for wildfires like we saw with the Table Rock fire in our valley several years ago. I believe several Triplet Ranch neighbors are present tonight to also share their, their efforts and concerns with you in greater detail. Finally is the topic of the access to the on-street trailhead parking. For some time now, BBNA has expressed concern about trail users driving to the trailhead and circulating through the neighborhood to access on-street parking on the downhill or west side of Council Springs. The last thing we want is recreationalist um, use of residents' driveways to turn around to access this parking. The same goes for those that are parked on the uphill side and are leaving after recreating. Right now, these driveways are the closest point above the parking to turn around. Unfortunately, we were told by HCHD that this is a, park, a city parks and recs issue because the source of the traffic is the trailhead and lack of sufficient parking is the problem. While we would all love to have tra a trailhead parking lot, that is not our issue or concern. This is a traffic flow concern. We feel ACHD's position is extremely short-sighted and lacks practical understanding of what is being proposed. We were really excited to hear of Boise Hunter Homes' willingness to address the concern by proposing a cul-de-sac, um, as you saw earlier, at the end of Council Springs at its intersection with Prominence Drive. This will eliminate traffic funneling into the neighborhood and will also provide an emergency vehicle turnaround below the homes. We feel this is an effective solution that will protect neighbors from unnecessary traffic. BBNA has, has had several discussions with ACHD and their concern is the additional 1,700 square feet of paving that will require maintenance. And the fact that the, uh, these additional, these trips are being caused by the city's use. It is absolutely beyond me to understand why they would refuse to do the right thing for a neighborhood for such a small incremental maintenance cost. As an analogy, ACHD's position is no different than the recent challenges BBNA and the neighbors had at Barber Junction due to, due to floater parking. Like Barber Junction, there's an existing use that generates traffic. And there are future neighbors that will purchase homes, likely not realizing what they are in for. The first spring after moving in, they will start to experience use of their personal property and U-turns in the driveways to go back downhill because it's the easiest option to do so. I don't think any of us would want that, especially as trail use increases in the future for a variety of reasons. At that point, the neighbor's natural recourse, as it has been in the past, is to ask BBNA for help in, in resolving the impact, exactly like Barber Junction. All this because today, AC, ACHD won't acknowledge an easily recognizable, recognizable impact and do the right thing to allow a turnaround below the residential lots. I don't want BVNA coming back to you with this issue a few years from now, and, and either do any of you. We have the opportunity to solve it now. We have a willing developer, thankfully, that will build it as it should be built. We need the city to step in and use your influence to convince ACHD to do the right thing on behalf of these future neighbors. While we think this should be a requirement of the project, we certainly understand Boise Hunter Homes' reluctance to adding it as a condition, totally understandable. As we have heard, they are willing to lobby for it and we hope the city is also, because I assure you we'll be back talking about this if we don't address it now. 
And the solution after the fact is never as easy or cheap as doing it right the first time. Please do what's right for these future neighbors and also provide a convenient way for all residents to use the trail and park on street given the absence of a trailhead parking lot. Thank you for hearing us out tonight and we trust you will support doing the right thing for this new development and our future neighbors. I'm happy to stand for any questions you might have. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Gary. Yep, go ahead. Gary, two, uh, one question for you, I think. But first, yeah, you know, I agree with you. ACHD and the city of Boise and Ada County all work for the people who live here, not for the people who live here who came to go ride their mountain bikes versus the people who live here uh, who occupy a particular lot. We all represent and work for the same people trying to solve the same problem. So um, your comments there were right on and um, I'm happy to do my best to try to follow up on that. My question for you is with respect to the bitter brush and the replanning, can you clarify for me a little bit the difference between what you're asking for and what uh, the developer and the applicant is asking for? I understand they're willing to do some, but it sounds like it's less than what you'd like. And I'm, I'm just trying to understand what the difference is. Certainly, Madam Mayor and, and um, Council Person Pageant. Um, as we understand it, um, we, we do understand that there's a, there's a requirement to um, uh, clear the hillside where excavations and earthwork are being made. Um, we're also concerned, we are concerned that Triplet Ranch, and, and I don't know if they're here tonight, um, to, they, they have shared with us some images of the work that they've started, basically to ridding the hillside that's a part of their HOA. Um, of, of the um, noxious weeds. And our concern certainly is because this hillside is contiguous, they're, um, you know, they're going the full step to remove um, the hillside of noxious weeds. We understand that that's not necessarily the requirement of the developer currently. And it's, uh, it seems unfortunate to us that the HOA is willing to, well, first of all, seize the benefit of clearing the hillside um, from, from a you know, fire safety standpoint. Um, and it seems as though it might be all for naught in the event that it's only done for a portion of the hillside adjacent to their HOA and not for the entire hillside um, on the Harris property. Okay, thank you. I think on rebuttal, I'll probably hypothetically potentially ask what the cost of that mitigation effort would be. So if Anybody needs to dig into their phones and do some research to be able to answer that question when it comes, that'd be great. Madam Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Um, Gary, you may not have the answer to this, but uh, if there isn't someone here from the Wildlife Mitigation um, Association, maybe you can attempt to answer it. Isn't it true that this portion of Harris Ranch will be members of that, will be required to pay an assessment into it and my reason for asking that question is wondering whether or not uh, the solution is to require the developer to um, restore and mitigate any land that they disturb and um, assume that the wildlife mitigation effort can, if there is land in between that and what the Triplet Ranch folks have worked on, uh, can work on that, that um, area that hasn't been treated yet. Wondering if that might be a solution to this. Madam Mayor and Council President Clay, um, as I understand it, they will be paying into the um, mitigation fund. Um, in terms of you know, opportunities for doing work on the hillside, um, I, I do know that Triplet Ranch, um, and speaking with their HOA president, I know that they have made contact with Angela, um, and there are some discussions um, that have occurred. We have not been privy to those. Um, I don't know how, candidly, I'm not sure how um, um, their priorities are established in terms of where work is done with the, with the resources that they have. So. Um, Sorry, I don't have that detail, but um, presumably okay. there is an opportunity there. I just don't know exactly where it stands today. 
Great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Further questions? All right, Gary, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and start with Teja online so that they have the chance to chat. So we're going to move into the, unless there are further questions for, yep. Um, and is there any, if anybody's online wanting to testify, go ahead and raise your hand now too, and, and we'll get to you after Teja. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, can I present my screen? Uh, we're all looking at each other, but you can't see okay. us looking at each other. We're we we here we go. Yep, oh, we can okay. see your we can see your screen now. Okay, excellent. Um, thank you very much, Madam Mayor, and respected council members um, and members of the audience. Uh, this is Teja Indukuri, and my home address is three one five zero South Quarter Swing Way. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak here. Um, I will keep it short and sweet here. Uh, what I wanted to say is where we're coming from, essentially, I am speaking not just on behalf of our family, but also um, my three other neighbors. The four of us are kind of severely impacted by this proposed Harris East development uh, because the proposed road expansion goes um, uh, is on a dirt road that currently backs to our properties. And essentially, uh, in the May 3rd Planning and Zoning Commission uh, meeting, we showed some pictures showing how we are impacted from light and sound pollution. And essentially we requested some light and sound mitigation in the form of either a berm or a fence or trees so that we, are, we can preserve our quality of life, enjoy our backyards. And we weren't opposed to the development. Um, we were happy uh, as long as these things were, concern, were taken care of. And the Planning and Zoning Commission graciously considered our request and of course included this mitigation as a condition for the approval. Uh, and all this is history. Actually the real reason I wanted to come here and say, take the time and say something here is, I wanted to just say it out. Uh, I'm, we are extremely thankful, all of us, to the efforts from Doug Fowler and Boise Hunter Homes um, as we worked back and forth and identified the right solution for our uh, the home for homeowners. It wasn't an easy back and forth here. Um, right after the Planning and Zoning Commission, Boise Hunter Homes was in our backyards collecting all the necessary measurements, where the trees were, how tall it was, elevation, you know. Uh, angles to see how they can fix this problem. Uh, they took a couple of weeks. They provided us with a, some pr proposals with trees and fences. Um, we were a little worried that it didn't fully address all our solutions. Uh, they went back and now a little bit of property uh, was not completely owned by him right behind our homes. And that was where uh, Mr. Doug Fowler um, um, graciously um, came in and jumped in and worked uh, with us. And they moved a couple of power poles, moved the road around, giving ourselves a little more space for the berm, identified a great plan for a fence uh, with trees, rock walls, and lots of trees. Um, we talked back and forth, increased the height of the fence a little bit. And finally, we ended up at a place where, you know, we, off, we, we allowed that fence to curve around a tree and give us full protection from the oncoming um, lights from the traffic. So at the end of the day, uh, all I wanted to say is the latest plans uh, that were uploaded, they contain an excellent proposal to fix the light and sound mitigation and all of us approve of the proposed solution. And really the number one reason I'm standing up here is I wanted to say very sincerely um, and very heartfelt thank you to Doug Fowler and Boise Hunter Homes for number one, understanding our concerns. Number two, um, you know, not just doing a little or not just doing halfway, but going above and beyond and working and offering multiple revisions to address all the issues. And, you know, at some point I did think it was a profit maximizing business venture, but you know, they showed us the human side of this. Time. So thank you for doing things the Boise way and working with us. An additional thank you to all involved, the city planning staff, planning and zoning commission and the city council as well. So I'm happy to be here and say, uh, stand up, look into everybody's eyes and say, thank you for fixing this problem for us. I really appreciate it. Thanks Teja. Anyone else online? Yes, Madam Mayor, we have several people online. Our first person is Rob Stark. Okay. We're going to go about five more minutes and then we're going to take a break. Go ahead. Yeah, it should be Rob Stark right now. Yep, we see you, Rob. 
Yep, Rob Stark, 6865 East Warm Springs Avenue, Boise, 83716. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Full disclosure, I am a BVNA board member. I am in support of the application. However, I do see the need for building the turnaround at the end of Council Springs that ACHD does not support. This addition would benefit both the future Harris East homeowners and users of the Homestead Trailhead. It would seem reasonable to project that the land swap, which would give the city some nearby foothills land, will lead to a Ridge to Rivers Trail that would connect the Homestead Trailhead to the rest of the Ridge to Rivers system. This in turn will lead to increased pressure at this trailhead. Uh, Council members Badgett and Woodings are well aware of another Barber Valley development that is near a popular recreation site that has resulted in problems for the homeowners of that development. So it would seem to me it would be best to try to get out ahead of any future problems between trail users and future residents instead of kicking the can down the road. Uh, the applicant is willing to include the turnaround that I feel will help keep trail users from heading up into the development and having an adverse effect on the future homeowners. That being said, the applicant has been in, acting in good faith and working with BVNA's concerns, and I don't want to see the applicant facing delays due to conditions being placed on the application that can't be fulfilled because of uncooperative agencies. Um, I am hopeful that the city can work with the applicant to find a solution that benefits the community without placing an undue burden on the applicant. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, our next speaker is Lillian Toomey. Welcome, Lillian. Thank you. My name is Lillian Toomey. My address is 5728 East Millet Drive. And I'm one of the Triplet Ranch neighbors. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the treatment of the hillside north of our neighborhood and south of this Harris East development, which is partially owned by residents of, of Triplet Ranch. So as uh, Gary mentioned from BVNA, our neighborhood is planning to do a hillside restoration project on our half of the hillside sometime this fall. We are wanting to remove dead and dying plants as well as fertilize and irrigate to promote the growth of native fire resistant plants and then thin and prune the remaining plants as needed. And this project has already partially begun with the, really the support and drive of our HOA president, um, Ben Hawks, and many other neighbors who, are, who have been really involved with this. Um, the project is, is really wonderful for our neighborhood because it will help control the wildfire risk as we are so close to this hill. Uh, it will help control erosion and promote soil conservation. And it also has the added benefits of making the area more, wild, more inviting to wildlife and contributing to a sense of neighborhood collaboration among us as HOA residents. We would really like for BHH to commit to completing a similar project on the upper portion of the hillside. And as Gary mentions, if the upper half of the hillside remains sown with cheat grass, our efforts at the base of the hillside will be overrun as, as seeds fall down um, to our area. We have met with BHH and requested that they collaborate with us by using their resources as a development company rather than neighborhood volunteer resources from their future residents to meet us halfway and mirror our efforts on their upper portion of that hill. I know there's concerns about um, personnel safety, um, but I believe that this option still ought to be investigated because I believe there may be a ways to maintain personnel safety as our HOA members have already worked on the lower portion of the hill in a safe manner. I would also ask if it's not um, the development company's responsibility to assume some risks involved with building in the foothills, including those that come with providing necessary safety measures for the existing residents as well as their own future residents. Uh, one further note is that I believe this development should be considered in the context of the current state of Southeast Boise, not in the context of 15 years ago when the package was first approved. And I believe that includes taking into account the existing climate conditions and wildfire risks instead of those from 2006. I know Councilman Badgett asked for an estimate of this project. I am going to make a ballpark estimate, but if Ben um, is able to testify later, he will be able to, to maybe get it a little more granular. I know he he scoped out about $5,100 as an estimate for our portion shared over our entire HOA. I believe our portion of the hill may be about one third to one fourth of the hill. Um, so I think ballparking it at around um, $30,000 for the entire hillside would be a very outside estimate. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, we have two more speakers. Our next one is Nikhil Nadaran. Okay. 
Hi, um, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak to the city council. Um, our, as uh, my, or sorry, my address is 5728 East Millet Drive, uh, Boise 83716. So while my wife and I raised a number of issues in our letter to the city planner, our primary concern is safety, uh, specifically safety from wildfire. We continue to have some wildfire related concerns after the PZC meeting and our talks with BHH. The Firewise website states that working collaboratively with your neighbor is important in helping to protect multiple properties. In this case, Harris East is going to be our neighbor. We need to have a collaborative conversation with the developer of Harris East on how we're going to protect ourselves as well as future residents of Harris East from wildfires. BHH has stated that they wish to work collaboratively, so we would like to see a commitment from them related to wildfire risk. We want to see them cleaning up the hillside between Triplet Ranch and Harris East. Our neighborhood is coordinating a cleanup that will address our portion of the hillside. Neighbors have already started on weed removal and a restoration project is planned for this fall. This covers the bottom portion of the hillside, but not the top. In researching the recommendations on the Idaho Firewise website, we found that it's necessary to create and maintain a defensible space around human dwellings. The website mentions that while a minimum of 100 feet of defensible space is necessary on flat ground, on sloped ground, the minimum is actually 200 feet. The Firewise website talks about three zones of defensible space. Zone three extends from 30 feet to the boundary of the defensible zone. In this case, zone three would extend upward from Triplet Ranch and downward from Harris East. Based on measurements from Google Maps, it appears that the distance from our personal backyard to the top of the hill is about 300 feet. Therefore, BHH would need to contribute to the creation and maintenance of a defensible space that's partially in their portion of the hillside. The entire hill might not fall under zone three for either neighborhood, but the vast majority by firewise standards needs to be pruned, have dead or dying vegetation removed, and have irrigation and fertilization methods arranged for the flourishing of native fire resistant plants. Although firewise is different from WUI, we do not think it's unreasonable to hold a high standard for our safety and the safety of future Harris East residents. The current heat wave is a reminder that the fire season is getting longer and hotter and more people moving into the wildland urban interface just increases that threat further. While BHH has said that they would consider a volunteer driven fire safe restoration effort on their portion of the hill, we think an effort led by BHH, not volunteers, needs to be mandated by the council based on Idaho Firewise recommendations. BHH has expressed concern that the hillside is steep and difficult to work on. However, we think this makes their intervention even more necessary. As citizens coordinating neighborhood cleanup efforts in our spare time off from work, we will be limited in our access to resources and our ability to effectively restore the entire hill. BHH, on the other hand, is a development company with ample resources, time, and understanding of the ecosystems in this area. We want to see a binding commitment from BHH rather than a promise that future residents will have the option to take this project on themselves. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take the last one and then take a break. Madam Mayor, our last speaker is John Mooney. Hi, John. Madam Mayor, uh, Council Members, John Mooney, 7153 East uh, Highland Valley Road. Can you hear me? Yes. And I was going to introduce my background video, if you can see it. It's the hillside that we're talking about. Um, so the area that uh, you can see the fence up above my head there, and you can see Triple Ranch off my left shoulder. Um, so the Harris East property and the steep hillsides that Todd talked about are in the background there. And, th and we, we're not talking about trying to restore that vegetation, but native vegetation for firewise fire -wise reasons. We're talking about that flat stuff uh, kind of up in my, up your, my upper right shoulder behind the fence line, which is Harris East property. So I, I just want to introduce that. That's probably the only vi visual you're going to get tonight. Uh, for the issue that we're talking about as far as restoration of the slopes. Um, and, and I also wanted to take an opportunity to celebrate the fact that uh, the Peace Valley Overlook is owned by the city and the Barber Valley Neighborhood Association began that effort in 2016, 2017 to buy it from a developer. And I think Todd would probably agree that if that parcel had been available, it would have been a part of this development and we'd have had seen more Foothills development. Um, so celebratory that we saved a lot of Foothills property here and uh, from development. And we're gonna see a great uh, lower Foothills recreational path on the, on the Ridge to River Network, all because uh, Boise Hunter Homes was so forward thinking. In fact, Mr. Hunter was one of the contributors to the uh, Peace Valley Overlook campaign. So I just wanted to call that out. And Ma Madam Mayor, as you know, the city chipped in the last 100,000 and that's why it is what it is. And that's why we're getting these great amenities in this uh, corner of the city. Um, 
another topic I wanted to touch on was uh, Gary, Gary and everyone covered the trailhead. We're, we're still scratching our head about ACHD on that one. We hope you can solve that. Thank you, Council Member Badgent, for uh, anything you can do uh, in that battle. And my, my closing thought is uh, specific plans. We are the only neighborhood that really understands how this works uh, as far as members of the public. Um, and, and we struggle with it as, as Doug Fowler would, would agree. Um, what we really want to see is the city to get aggressive about SPO3, locale, Syringa Valley, whatever you want to call it. But best practices have to get instilled into that program. Corey Barton Homes began that in 2015. It was, uh, it's on the website with a 2016 date. Best practices have certainly evolved since then. Um, SPO1 is 243 pages. SPO3 is 76. It's very rudimentary. I've talked to Cody Riddle about this a, a, a couple of times, and we're engaged with the planning staff regularly. We really think our uh, experience with SPO 1 and 2 would be helpful if you, the council members, would press the city staff to take a look at how we can improve the plan for SPO 3. Thank you. Thank you, John. And with that, we're going to take a break for about five minutes.
All right, we're going to go ahead and start again. I have a question. Is anybody that signed up in advance on the sheet not related to the applicant? I've got Steve, like not a party to the, not part of the applicant's party for this topic. I've got Steve, is it Cloyd, Heather Dunning, Dean Hastrider, Alicia Minicello, Tina Collins, and Steven, I'm not sure if it's Clo or Chow. All our party are part of the applicant's party. Okay, yep. Great, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna see now if there's, are there members of the public that are not part of the applicant's party that are here to testify on this? Okay. Are there other members of the public online? No, Madam Mayor. Okay, what I'm gonna do then, I'm given that this is a subdivision, we've heard from the neighborhood association members of the party, the applicants um, representatives. We're gonna move into now to see if the, if council has any further questions for the applicant or staff, and then we'll go ahead with um, the closure kind of it's not rebuttal right now it's not an appeal. What is this closing yeah. statement. Yeah. yeah, and then you, you'll be able to answer um, anything you more you need to say on this topic. So with that I'm going to open to questions. Madam Mayor. Yeah. Um, our, probably staff and perhaps the applicants um, representative just wondering. Um, there is not a condition about wild, uh, about mitigation for revegetating. Um, wondered what discussions have been had at the staff level around that issue, and uh, if you have any solutions. Uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Council President Clegg, um, typically with subdivisions, straight subdivisions, we don't get into mitigation or um, uh, we stick with the revegetation of those spaces that have been disturbed, and that's how our code directs us yeah. to do those things. So we've uh, not really examined um, the other side of that. Okay. So by code, the the um, applicant will have to revegetate anything they disturb. Will they be also required to um, try to minimize the um, moving of seeds as they do disturb the land onto land that might already be revegetated? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council President Clegg, that is correct. That is usually part of the revegetation plan that is part of the Category 3 Hillside Review. Okay. Were you asking Heath too? Yeah, Great. Yeah. Madam Mayor, uh, Council President Clegg, Heath Clark, 251 East Front Street. Um, so on this issue, um, you know, the, the owner of the property current, the owner of the property future will continue to be a good steward of the property. This isn't a question of, uh, it's not a question of cost, frankly. Um, as And Kevin has as, uh, appropriately stated the um, code requirements. You know, I, I do wanna emphasize our concerns and then I think we have a solution that would, I, I think work. Um, these are steep slopes. Yeah. They would be dangerous for personnel to access. Um, the, there is minimal topsoil in these areas because of this, the steepness of those slopes. Adding topsoil would be difficult. You're going to end up, if you're irrigating it, you're going to be creating huge erosion problems. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely would uh, warn everyone against ir irrigating along these steep hillsides. Um, once these homes are online, there we will be over 800 individual members of the Harris Ranch Wildlife Mitigation Association. Uh, right now, we're just shy of the 800 mark. Um, we think that coordinating any efforts to do a revegetation through the Harris Ranch Wildlife Mitigation Association is the appropriate route here. Um, we would love to work with their experts to uh, identify solutions. And as we were just discussing this, again, this is not a matter of cost in terms of the overall size of this project and the scope of what's going to be expended. This isn't a big deal, um, but we are willing to contribute $30,000 toward those efforts to the Harris Ranch Wildlife Mitigation Association. Again, we really think that this needs to be done right. It shouldn't be done, done kind of haphazardly. What's been discussed to date, we think raises major concerns, but we're confident that through the Harris Ranch Wildlife Mitigation Association, an appropriate solution could be had. Thank you, Madam Mayor, follow up. 
So um, Heath, I think I heard you suggest that you're willing to donate $30,000 to the Wildlife Mitigation Association. Um, and assuming that you would accept that as a condition and also as a condition that you will um, work with them on your revegetation plan. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council, Member, Council President Clegg, are you, are you referring to the revegetation plan that's on the sites that would be disturbed? I just want to be precise in the language. Yeah, well, and that's that's a question I have. I just want to make sure that, you know, whatever happens on that revegetation will work with the wildlife mitigation revegetation and not separate. So mm -hmm. at least at least consult with them. Happy to consult. To yeah, okay. Happy to consult. All right. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yes. I guess just some clarity there to make sure that I'm understanding it. So there would already be the mitigation by code that you would have to do. And we would be talking about an additional $30,000 on top of that. Is that correct? Madam Mayor, Council Member Halliburton, that's correct. So okay. the area that's going to be revegetated by code is the area that we disturb. And um, we didn't really go into that in connection with this, um, this presentation tonight. But the areas that are going to be disturbed are, are pulled away from the top of the slope for a number of reasons to avoid erosion and also to minimize view impacts. So everything that's going to be revegetated primarily is going to be on top. Mm -hmm. What we're talking about here is on the steep slopes on the sides, and that's where the contribution would, come, would go to. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Madam Mayor. Yes. I, I do have one question. I'm sorry. Yeah, Heath, I think you were probably involved in the conversations with ACHD. And I heard one of the reasons that uh, that agency expressed concern was the maintenance, potential maintenance of the extra space on the turnaround. But looks like maybe you weren't involved. Um, <laughs> but sometimes there's more going on than we hear. It, like, it, what else did that agency tell you, if anything? Uh, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Badgett. Um, yeah, they they expressed concern with the additional uh, area to be maintained. As as Gary VC pointed out, we we did some math on it. It's roughly seventeen hundred square feet more. When you look in the grand scheme of what ACHD maintains, that's pretty minuscule. Uh, they also had some other concerns about maybe uh, confusion of residents uh, turning around, residents driving down the hill and heading up. And if someone's trying to turn around and that at the same time, I, I didn't really think that that was that big of a concern. It'll obviously have to be striped, no parking. Uh, you can park, you can't park in the cul-de-sac. Um, it, it, it really, it works uh, from an engineering standpoint. It's really, we're, we're confined with some topography. When you look on the west side of where Council Springs Road, that, that area drops off pretty sharp into the creek. We thought originally maybe we could put a hammerhead going that direction. It just doesn't work. Where we have the cul-de-sac shown is really the, the, a flat spot and it works pretty well right there. We understand ACHD, ACHD's concerns. Like I said before, we're willing to continue to work with the Neighborhood Association and go visit with ACHD. I think we can find a solution to this uh, issue. Um, and, and like I said, we're, we're willing to continue to work on it. But those were the, really the concerns that ACHD brought up. They didn't provide me anything in writing. It was just a phone call saying that we can't support this after we looked at it and discussed it for a handful of reasons. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll go ahead. Is it Heath, are you doing closing arguments? Doug, great. And just to be clear there, see, I'm, I just, I think that there might be some confusion in the audience. Typically when we have an application, one, this is the subdivision is not a public hearing. We have pu public hearings for things that don't already have a right. We started it this evening, um, but an applicant, even in a public hearing has their, their time allotted. Um, but then we asked that they not um, bring other parties to the applicant in for additional time. And so given that this is a subdivision, I exercise that request this evening at the break, um, but we'll finish with a rebuttal. Thank you. Um, uh, Doug Power, 801 uh, Main uh, Suite 501, Boise, Idaho. Um, Mayor, council members, um, uh, just a couple of quick things. Um, first of all, on Todd's response to Councilman uh, Halliburton's question about the foothills, and the number of lots and why. Um, there was one uh, very important uh, thing that was left out and that was on this particular parcel when we went under contract with Boise Hunter Homes, 
we uh, limited them to between uh, 60 and 70 lots. Um, that was a condition of the contract. Um, uh, admittedly, uh, development in the foothills is very expensive, and uh, we have um, uh, a lot of uh, about another 118 entitlement entitled lots. But um, once upon a time, would that have been difficult and expensive? Uh, yes. In this market, not quite so much. Um, we like open space too. That's why uh, I think the Harrises still have about 306 acres in open space and their foundation has 276 acres next to Wild Horse. Um, with that and with um, uh, our request to, uh, for uh, approval um, of, uh, of the uh, turnaround area as either the hammerhead that's shown or the uh, uh, cul-de-sac if we can uh, collectively uh, get it from ACHD and uh, with the contribution on the um, on the uh, on the uh, hillside um, behind Triplet Ranch, um, we would ask for your approval. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the not public hearing, <laughs> whatever this was, and um, leave it to you all to discuss and make a motion. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I will move approval of Harris Ranch East Subdivision SUB 21-9 Boise City Preliminary Plat at 3201 South Council Springs Road with uh, one additional condition to be added to the site-specific conditions uh, that the um, developer will donate $30,000 to the Wildlife Mitigation Association uh, for vegetation between uh, of the hillside uh, between them and Triple Atlanta Ranch, and that they will consult with the association before completing their uh, revegetation requirements. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Discussion? Uh, Madam Mayor, while I did not add it as a um, condition, I would also like to note in the um, conversation here that this is a preliminary plat and uh, before we see it at final plat, it's being approved with a hammerhead. And I think it's fully acceptable um, from a legal and uh, fire perspective for it to remain that hammerhead, but we would, I would like to direct staff to also, before we see the final plat, continue to explore a turnaround uh, as uh, suggested by the Neighborhood Association. Madam Mayor, uh, I agreed and I seconded the motion for a couple of reasons. First, um, everything complies with SPO1. That's the most important thing. Second, uh, this is a subdivision and it's probably not the time to, especially sitting up here, like in our meeting, be coming forward with fully fledged uh, plant mitigation plans. It's not, it's just, it's not necessary at the subdivision stage. And frankly, as we get into actually building this out, there'll be a lot more base from the HOA to potentially fund it and a lot more experience on site to figure out what needs to be done. Um, as to the turnaround, you know, I think everybody wants people to be able to turn around down there and everybody wants to going forward for as long as these homes are there, have a minimum number of conflicts between recreational users and homeowners. And we've seen in other parts of the city that those kinds of con conflicts can be taxing and difficult for our city to administer. It, it causes a police burden. It causes just a transactional time and energy burden on the part of city staff. So that's something that we care about. ACHD obviously cares about the streets and roads and they have their own set of concerns. And you know they're worried about their set of things and neither of us frankly are experts on the other. So it wouldn't be correct or fair to the applicant to try to condition this on obtaining from ACHD uh, a turnaround that, you know, we don't even know all the reasons that they're not able to do it. Um, but the applicant is very willing, it's very clear to continue having those conversations with ACHD. And, and the fact that, you know, everybody does want to reduce those conflicts. We all do work for the same people. And the goal is to come up with a complete, you know, project out there that works for everyone, makes me hopeful that as those conversations continue, something will work out. Um, I'm a little unclear on the motion. I think it was made in a way that will allow either the current hammerhead plan or the turnaround plan to take effect without having to come back to us. That was my understanding. Um, and I think that's what the, the maker intended. Um, Madam Mayor, can I clarify that? 
So um, while we typically don't talk about final plats, uh, when we receive them, they're on the consent agenda. They all always come to us on the consent agenda and we can always pull them off if we so choose. So we will at least see it again when it comes becomes final. And my hope is we'll see a turnaround. Madam Mayor. Uh, it's not very often that we have somebody call in uh, a neighbor who's going to have 59 houses uh, past their backyard in a new paved road. Uh, say thank you to the developer and for going the extra mile uh, to work with them to mitigate some of the issues of the sound and the light. Um, I think that's a testament to the, the work that you've put into this. I'm excited about the 93 acres of open space and your commitment to continuing to have open space and also the commitment to uh, the $30,000 to the Wildlife Mitigation Association. I think that Lillian's probably feeling good that she threw out a good number for you all to shoot for at 30,000. Um, and I'm excited that you all are, are working with the other neighborhoods on that. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanna thank uh, Boise Hunter Homes uh, for again, you know, bending, bending over backwards just to help uh, remedy all of these uh, potential issues that the, the neighbors were facing. And I continuously see that from you folks and uh, thank you very much. Okay, with that clerk, we call the roll. Holly Burton. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Woodings. Yes. Bajan. Yes. Clegg. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. We are now we are now going to move into the appeal for the evening. DRH 21-12. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, members of council. Uh, this item, as you noted, is an appeal of a historic preservation commission's denial of a certificate of appropriateness. Um, I'd like to take the time to walk you through the appeal and the grounds and briefly our response to that this evening. And then um, Ted Venegas, our historic preservation planner is here to answer questions as it relates to uh, historic preservation standards. Uh, the denial, as you saw included in your packet, included a request uh, to demolish a non-contributing home remove trees and reroute a canal. The background I acknowledge is a bit confusing, uh, so I'll try to walk you through that and help you understand how we, how we got to where we are uh, today. The project did start with a code enforcement case for the removal of 10 trees. Uh, we received and approved an application to mitigate for that removal. That decision was appealed. We also received a separate application uh, that was filed to relocate an open canal on the property. Uh, when it became clear that that would be appealed, we retracted that approval. All of this, along with uh, the proposed demolition of a non-contributing home and the construction of a new one was then bundled. We took all of this as a package to the Historic Preservation Commission, which ultimately denied the request um, in March. Uh, in the appeal, uh, the applicant included three grounds and I'd like to briefly respond to each. Uh, the first, they believe that the denial related to the tree specifically violated state and city code and that the Historic Preservation Commission provided no uh, justification. They suggest that the only thing that was achieved was eliminating our ability to require uh, mitigation. As it relates to the appeal, we, we agree the appellant is correct. Uh, the approval of a certificate of appropriateness is our mechanism to require those, those new plantings. And so we believe they were correct in this regard, but that's not for a second to suggest we condone what was condone what was done. In fact, we immediately asked uh, the enforcement team to pursue citations. And while it's not before you uh, this evening, that is be being addressed uh, outside of this, this process. Uh, the second ground relates to relocation of the canal. The applicant believes that we exceeded our statutory authority by retracting that approval. Again, when it became clear that the intent was to appeal both applications, the canal and the removal of the trees, we bundled everything. Um, our intent was uh, here was to provide a path forward where everything was bundled. We could look at things holistically and make it as clear as possible for everyone um, involved, applicant and neighbors alike. Uh, the, I would note that the applicant did originally intend to cover the canal. Uh, they came back with an alternative uh, to relocate the canal and keep it open air generally in the alignment you can see in red on the, on the screen. 
This would allow for the construction of a new home uh, while maintaining this unique feature to the neighborhood. Again, the slide you can see on the screen shows the approximate location of the relocated canal, and you can clearly see the trees that were removed. And now the final ground uh, for the appeal was demolition of the existing non-contributing home and then the construction of the new home. Uh, in this case, again, given the other elements, we did include all of this in one package. And reviewing the record, uh, the commission did actually got into questioning the contributing versus non-contributing status of that existing home. Uh, they went as far as suggesting that the applicant uh, should resurvey the property to make a new determination on the contributing or non-contributing status. Um, from our perspective, the property owner has rights that go along with an existing classification as non-contributing. Non uh, they're vested in the rights they have at the time of time of application. And uh, we, would be, we would be concerned if we were picking and choosing which property should be surveyed or resurveyed at the time of a specific application. Um, given the focus on the other elements of the proposal and the suggestion of resurveying the property, the commission really didn't evaluate that new home. That home, as indicated in the original staff packet, we believe and still believe is consistent with the approval criteria. So we do acknowledge there was probably an error um, in this regard. So I briefly touched on each of the grounds for appeal. Again, we don't believe that in the record there was evidence uh, to deny the application. Uh, we certainly shouldn't be requiring properties to be resurveyed after an application is su submitted, but we certainly acknowledge the frustration on the part of the neighbors with the removal of those trees without approval. It put the commission and now you and our team in a very difficult uh, position. Uh, that being said, the only way to get new trees is through a conditioned, conditioned approval. So with that, we are recommending you overturn uh, the decision of the commission uh, this evening. Again, the citation, a citation process is something to be worked on outside of this. Uh, finally, if you overturn the decision and we're directed to return with findings and conditions, we suggest that larger, larger trees than would typically be required uh, be included as condition of approval. For example, rather than the typical two inch caliper trees that we, we would require, we would suggest uh, three inch or even four inch caliper trees for a couple reasons. They'll have a more immediate visual and environmental um, impact. Uh, we believe that's certainly justified. And if we were asked before these trees were removed, that would have been our approach in evaluating uh, the application. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yeah, go ahead. Cody, I'm a little bit familiar with this because it's about five blocks from my home. And one thing I, I'm just not clear on is how many structures will be there when all is said and done, if this is, uh, if the appeal is granted and this is approved, because right now there's a structure that's old and existing and, you know, substantially demolished, but still under construction, they're preserving some work on the front. Then there's that other older, presently untouched home that is, you know, clearly they're asking to demolish, but I, it's, it, I can't quite connect the dots to get to the final product in my mind. Madam Mayor, Councilmember Bajan, it's uh, the, the plan, the site plan we see on the screen shows uh, you'd have a new single family residence at the front of the front of the lot, really centered. You can see the dashed line with the canal kind of centered on the property and then a detached garage uh, towards the back. And again, the, the canal and the, the light blue would be the, uh, I guess, roughly rough location. The canal would be open air kind of along the back of the sidewalk. I see. So that. Okay, I understand now. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Um, Cody, just to be clear on the process tonight, um, the trees were removed without a certificate of appropriateness. Um, the applicant came for a certificate to demolish and initially that was approved then that was withdrawn so that they could be put together. Um, I'm, I'm asking this to ask if it's appropriate to talk about whether what grounds uh, were found administratively uh, that made the demolition of the existing home acceptable. 
Um, Madam Mayor, I'd, I'd probably ask, ask Ted to answer that best, but typically in our in our um, review matrix, this is a non non contributing home, and so typically that is something that's that's permissible. Uh, but that's only one of five. That's only one of five criteria, and you have to meet three of five, if I'm not mistaken. Madam Mayor, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Clegg, that's correct. And so, do you know what the other two were? If we overturn tonight, we need to yeah. make a finding, and I need to know what those findings should be. That's correct. This is probably where I should defer to Ted. Thank you, um, Madam Mayor, uh, Council President Clegg. It was actually the canal that was approved and withdrawn, so the house um, wasn't um, okay. initially approved administratively. A new house has to be approved by the commission. Um, a demolition can um, be approved administratively if, um, you know, uh, being non-contributing is the key uh, finding there, and it can be approved administratively. In this case, um, the applicants were going to come in with an administrative approval for demolition, and that's when we pulled back and said, no, we're not going to accept uh, okay. this application for uh, approval for demolition. We're going to that's kind of when we decided everything's kind of needs to be pulled together and brought to the historic preservation commission. Um, so, you know, the findings for, for demolition, I would say the key finding is that it is a non-contributing structure. Um, uh, the other findings are deal with, does the new construction uh, generally meet the guidelines? So is the new construction, um, the new house, the design of the new house, uh, consistent with the guidelines, is it congruous with the neighborhood? Uh, so that's that's one of the findings. The other finding is, has the applicant um, determined that re, uh, rehabilitation of the existing structure, have they provided a cost estimate of demo new build versus re, just rehabilitating the existing structure? That finding is rarely uh, provided, especially for non-contributing houses. Uh, so that finding is is usually not met or even tried to be met. Uh, other findings deal with um, is the house um, uh, doesn't meet other state or local historic requirements, which this house doesn't. So it it's non-contributing. It's also not considered to be eligible for the national register, and it doesn't meet other state, local, or national standards for historic preservation. And so those are kind of generally the findings. And, and though we did not administratively approve the demolition of this house, you know, I, I think it could have been recommended for, it was recommended for approval with new construction for oh, the- Okay, so to be clear tonight, what, what we're being asked is whether or not the applicant can go forward with relocating the ditch, mitigating the trees and constructing a single family residential structure. Can we do that and leave the demolition of the existing single family house back up to the Historic Preservation Commission who I think are the appropriate body to make that finding initially, especially given the location of it, it looks to me like it is in exactly the location that the garage is being proposed in. And um, they could make that finding later. I, I just, I'm reluctant to rule on something tonight that we don't have any advice on other than what you've just provided. Does that make sense? Um, Madam Mayor, Council President Clegg, um, you, it could be remanded back to the Historic Preservation Commission, just specifically review of demolition of the existing uh, structure. Um, are you suggesting that the new house would be approved? Well, that, or... that's what I'm asking. What, okay. uh, this is, I'm trying to, in my mind, get procedurally what, what we can and can't do tonight, what, what's possible, what's not. And... Um, uh, Madam so, Mayor. so we we could overturn the ruling, approve everything except the demolition, and remand that. I guess is my question. Madam Mayor, just a legal point.
point of point yeah. of order. And and just to help clarify the procedure to to council member uh, Clegg's question, the city code development code procedures provide that uh, if there were some unlawful or improper procedure, it may be remanded, um, but that otherwise, if error is found, the decision may be reversed or modified. So so not not quite a clear procedure towards remand here uh as awkward right. as that might make it or as difficult as that might make it that that may not be a, a clean path to take okay i appreciate that thank you any other questions for ted coming up madam mayor uh, Council members, Jeff Bauer, 601 West Bannock in Boise, here on behalf of the applicants, Tom and Andrea Colgan. Uh, Mr. Venegas, if you could, could you pull up my slide deck? Thank you. While I'm waiting for that, I'll jump out of order and address Councilwoman Clegg's question. I agree with your council. Um, remand isn't really appropriate here. It's um, modify or reverse. And I think one really important fact here is that the Historic Preservation Commission in their decision actually did find that three of the five demolition criteria were satisfied in this case. So they made that finding that you're that you would like them to go back and make in this case. They were concerned about the classification of the property, which I'll get into in a minute, but they did make that finding. All right. Wait, I have a question. Sorry. They made the finding that three of the five things were met, but they still denied the demolition. Madam Mayor, that's correct. And that's one of the grounds of error that we articulated in our memo. Okay. Um, I wish I had a clicker here, but uh, I'll just get started. So again, wanna thank planning staff, both Mr. Venegas and Mr. Riddle for all their time and, and the council for your time tonight. I know after that, situation this seems like small beans but it's a really big deal to these two individuals so thank you for your time um, there are three certificates of appropriateness at issue here one for the retroactive tree removal one for the relocation of the canal and then a third for the demolition of the existing structure and the construction of a new single family home tom and andrea colgan started looking at this property about a year ago and they were interested in the property because their daughter and their family live next door. So council member Bajan, that's that house that you're seeing all the activity on, um, which also went through a, a lot of certificate of appropriateness applications. This one is immediately next door. So it starts to be confusing about what's going on, but on this site, just this one single family home. So the existing property is, I'm sorry, the existing structure is about 900 square feet, two bedroom, one bath, constructed in 1940. Uh, because the existing structure wouldn't satisfy our client's family needs, they hired a bunch of consultants to try to figure out what redevelopment options they had. You guys are all familiar with Beth Lassen, former HPC commissioner. They hired her to determine what the status of the property was. Her research indicated it was non-contributing. They also had their own architect, Leah McMillan, who's participating virtually, I should have said, um, also determined that the property was non-contributing. In addition to architects and researching the historic status, they also hired SPF water engineers to look at the canal relocation. I mean, we're not hiding the ball here. The canal ran right directly through the property diagonally. So relocation here is required to accommodate the size of the home that we want to build. And the home size that we are looking at is about 1600 square foot footprint. So not huge. And it does meet all the applicable zoning setbacks. So after talking with architects, engineers, city staff, they determined that the property was non-contributing non and that it did have redevelopment potential. And so they moved forward and purchased the property. Switching to the to the applications. We did have the uh, removal of trees without a certificate of appropriateness. And as Mr. Riddle mentioned, planning staff reached out to the applicants and said, hey, that wasn't right. You need to file a, a certificate of appropriateness to permit what you've done. They promptly did that. It was administratively granted with a condition of approval that the property be uh, replanted with seven large caliper trees. 
Um, that is the tree mitigation slide that you're seeing on the slide in front of you. So in addition to large plantings in the right of way, seven large on-site trees as well. Uh, Mr. Riddle mentioned three to four inch caliber. That's totally fine with us. The condition said trees between 10 and 20 feet, but however uh, the council would like to word the condition is fine with us. That permit was administratively granted on January 5th and appealed on January 15th. The HPC did ultimately, re, uh, re, did ultimately deny that approval. Uh, no basis was articulated as Mr. Riddle mentioned and, and that is one of the errors that we articulated. Uh, so we believe it was arbitrary. Um, kind of taking a step back on the tree removal, I want to clarify some of the background facts. Our client uh, hired Brown's Tree Service to remove these trees. Can I get a slide, please? And in hiring Brown's Tree Service, they specifically asked the company if any permits were required. The, the company required uh, responded that none were required. In addition to directing those questions to the tree service, my client also looked on the Bo Boise Forestry website couldn't find any information that private trees on private property were regulated. And I'm only bringing this up to say that this isn't a situation of, of uh, you know, ignoring the regulations or willful ignorance. This truly was a mistake. And it's a mistake that I know my clients uh, are genuinely sorry for. And so again, we're, we're very happy with the condition of approval to do the on-site mitigation. And they've also asked me recently to reach out to Boise Forestry as well as Parks and Rec to try to identify some offsite mitigation. Um, to date, they haven't provided us any specific projects in any parks, but um, it was recommended that we could make a donation to the tree challenge, which we're more than happy to do to, to offset the trees that were removed. So now moving on to the canal. Um, again, this, this permit was approved administratively and um, I'm not sure it's relevant tonight, but but we sort of disagree with the facts as staff presented them. We we don't believe this permit was ever validly challenged, and it's our opinion that it's currently final. Um, it was approved on January 15th, and no appeal was ever filed within the 10-day period. Um, I'm not aware of any provision in the city code that allows the city to just retract final permits, but nonetheless, um, we're here tonight and we'd ask you to reverse the planning, I'm sorry, the Historic Preservation Commission's denial, because we do meet the standards for the relocation. And those standards are identical. <laughs> those standards are identical to demolition. So again, as Mr. Venegas mentioned, the key factor here is that the property as a whole is non-contributing in the district. There's nothing to indicate that this irrigation facility is any different. So it would also be treated as non-contributing. Um, really important too, I think that um, we did originally wanna pipe this structure. That would be the cheaper, easier thing to do. Instead, at the request of neighbors, we decided to relocate it. The relocation will include some beautification. So instead of cracked concrete walls, we'll have stacked stone walls. Uh, instead of 91 feet of open water, we're gonna have 114 feet uh, additional uh, open water for, for habitat and wildlife and just general enjoyment. Um, so we would ask you to reverse the HPCs, what we consider illegal denial of that, and also find that relocation is appropriate. Lastly, um, can I get a slide, please? One more. Relocation criteria that Mr. Venegas already went through, so I'll, I'll skip over that real quick. One more, sorry, Ted. Here's a picture of the new home, uh, and I'll take one more slide. So turning to the, the, final, can, the final certificate of appropriateness, this one wasn't administratively approved. So this one went to the, to the HPC for their initial decision. This is an excerpt from the decision, Council Member Clegg, and you can see that the decision highlighted there three out of the five findings for demolition were met. So it's our position that that's sort of the end of the story here. Uh, we agree with planning staff's uh, project report that recommended uh, demolition. 
We also agree with the written decision that recommended de demolition. So really the issue here is reclassification. And I don't wanna belabor the point. We totally agree with, with Mr. Riddle. Um, it's never been the city's practice to, re to redesignate properties as contributing during a pending application. You know, I, th I think there's Idaho law that would prevent that. It is, we, we would consider that a vested right and that someone made an investment back decision um, in buying the property and expecting to, to be able to redevelop it. Um, and that's all I have substantively, you know, for the reasons that, that I previously stated, we think there are several errors that were committed by the HPC. So this is opened up to you all to make a new decision, a modification or an approval. Um, and we agree with all of staff's recommendations for, for conditions. Madam Mayor. Yes. One question. Um, staff noted that one of the criteria was uh, new construction would be consistent with the guidelines. Do you intend to be consistent with the guidelines with your new construction? Madam Mayor, Council Member Thompson, yes. Um, I, I kind of glossed over that, I'm sorry. And again, Ms. McMillan is participating virtually to provide any more detail you'd like, but uh, planning staff did provide a very detailed analysis of all of section five of the design guidelines and found that we conformed. Um, I'm getting in the weeds now. Planning staff also recommended one additional window on the facade that sort of got glossed over. We're also happy with that condition. So if if um, you would like to impose that condition that Mr. Venegas wanted, we would accept that as well. Thank you. Okay. Looks like that's it for now, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so we've got, is anybody from Nina here online? Yes, Madam Mayor. It is Kate Henwood. Okay. Hello, I'm here. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Kate Henwood and I'm here tonight as co-chair of the North End Neighborhood Association's Historic Preservation Committee. We testified on this matter at the March 29th Historic Preservation Commission meeting and those comments are on record, so I won't repeat them here, but we do want to express our concern with the disheartening trend of folks moving into the North End presumably attracted to its historic nature and unique character, who then make wholesale changes to their property that readily dismantle those irreplaceable features and elements that make it, make it what it is. Sometimes within the guidelines and too many times not. Our committee's primary mission is one of education and prevention to avoid situations like this in the future. Unfortunately, we cannot do that alone and do rely on our city partners to uphold their commitments to us as historic district residents to enforce the code as written and demand accountability. I'd now like to read to you a portion of a letter that we submitted to this, submitted in this spirit to the planning department, copying this council on May 30th. The Historic Preservation Committee of the North End Neighborhood Association takes strong exception to the administrative decision by the City of Boise's Code Compliance Officer regarding the recent unauthorized removal of mature trees at 717 North 19th Street in Boise's North End neighborhood. We request review of this decision because of the dangerous precedent that it now sets. The premature and unsupervised removal of 10 mature trees trees on this lot prior to the issuance of a certificate of appropriateness by the city of Boise cannot be fully mitigated by an after the fact issuance of a certificate of compliance and the stipulation that replacement trees eventually be planted. Following the above line of logic, no tree is safe within the city of Boise. The North End is a city designated historic district. Cutting down trees without review or approval by the city is in violation of city rules and regulations. If penalties are to be limited to a modest replanting plan, this does not compensate for the damage done as replanting would have been in order either way. If unauthorized removal of trees can be posthumously approved by the city with negligible consequence, then what prevents this unfortunate situation from being repeated again and again in the future? We further request the imposition of commensurate fines in this case to both homeowner and contractor so that the city of Boise regulations regarding code compliance, submission of certificates of appropriateness, and forestry regulations retain some measure of genuine sustainable effectiveness. Uh, and 
This application continues to be top of mind and of great consternation to many MENA members. I would now also like to read to you a statement that was written and signed by 83 North End neighbors. Again, to be clear, this letter comes from individual citizens and I am reading it on their behalf, not on that of Nina as a whole. The property located at 717 North 19th Street has been an iconic and beloved property in this neighborhood. Generations of North Enders have enjoyed feeding the ducks and watching the wildlife in the century old Boise Canal, one of the few year round canals in Boise. The position of this home on this lot is unique and gives a feeling of openness along the canal. It is deeply ingrained in the character and culture of our North End community. While the illegal removal of trees from the property has been a tragic blow to the character of this neighborhood, we face further threats to the appearance and feel of a street that has for generations remained essentially unchanged. With proposed diversion of the historic canal and demolition of a quaint 1939 home in pursuit of maximum lot coverage for a large new home. The goals and guidelines of historic preservation in this district are clearly stated and this project contravenes them. As a resident of this, as residents of this neighborhood and this historic district, we urge the city council to uphold the historic preservation commission's denial of this project. Um, again, that was written and signed by 83 individuals. Our committee's efforts are and will continue to be on problem solving, which we're working on in the form of code enforcement, tree removal education among residents and vendors, and pursuing updated survey data, all of which we hope will go a long way in preventing the scenario from playing out again down the line. Thank you so much for your time and consideration this evening. Madam Mayor, yes. may I ask a question? Of course. Um, thank you, Kate. Um, yes. I have a question about um, what sort of consideration do you give when an applicant has received erroneous information from a vendor, such in this case about whether or not permitting was required for the removal of trees? Yeah, I. it's a difficult position. Um, you know, there, there are honest errors, but at the end of the day, our, you know, 10 mature trees are gone from our tree canopy. Um, and that just, that just can't go unaddressed. Um, so I mean, our point is that the, the code is, is written and as it is, and we're, you know, we just, this sets a, this sets a major precedent. Um, it, it wasn't 10, one tree, it was 10 trees. And that's just, it is a huge loss to, like I said, our, our canopy and the, um, you know, the character of our neighborhood. And um, we're just, we want to see that rectified and avoid it in the future. Just a follow up, Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you, Kate. Is there anything in the code that says that ultimate responsibility for premature removal of trees before they've been permitted, that that ultimately falls on the applicant and not on misinformation or inaccurate information received by a vendor? Is that a question for me? Because I, am, I unfortunately okay. do not. <laughs> and, and I would jump in here, Kate, if you're unable to answer the question, given that it's specific to the code, staff might be better equipped to answer the question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Sanchez, there is nothing in the code that says that. Thank you, Ted. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Are you, are you here to testify on this? Are you a part of your record? Great, come on up. Katie, you also? And you're a part of your record? Great. You guys know the drill, so I'm not gonna go look through the list to double check. Uh, David Klinger, 1404 North 24th Street. I am a, a party of record. I also serve on the Historic Preservation Committee of the North End Neighborhood Association. Uh, this re regrettable- are you, representing, are you representing yourself? I am representing was, myself. Okay, great. I'm supplementing Kate Henwood's uh, testimony. This regrettable outcome should never have occurred, gentlemen and ladies. It should have never had to come before you for review. The manner in which this whole project was pursued 
displayed a flagrant disregard of the rules governing development in a designated historic district. Whether this disregard was accidental or willful doesn't change the poor outcome for this neighborhood. You know, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Retroactive approval of removal of mature trees, failure to impose meaningful penalties for code violations is unacceptable, insufficient, and makes a mockery of city regulations. At the time this project came, first came before the Historic Preservation Commission, I asked whether there was even any written concurrence from the canal company that a project like this could be undertaken. Was it feasible from an engineering standpoint? I couldn't get an answer to that. I don't believe it existed in the record in written form. It was a verbal approval. Well, you don't do things like this on verbal approvals. Simply put, when you're developing within a historic district, there's an expectation of a higher standard of care, of behavior, and respect for community values. And in this case, it didn't happen. The decision of the Historic Preservation Commission should be upheld. But I do wish to commend Cody Riddle, the Deputy Planning Director, for taking the initiative in response to the letter from Nina to draft an advisory to arborists operating in this city that there is a process, an established process for treating trees as essential elements of historic districts. That certificates of appropriateness are necessary and that approvals must be granted in advance and not retroactively. So if there's any good to have come out of this deplorable incident, it's this slim read. Thank you. Thank you. Katie, go ahead. Wait, come on up. Yeah. Sorry, I mumbled not into the mic. <clears throat> Um, Katie Fight, 1006 North 5th Street, Boise, Idaho. Um, I urge you to uphold the findings of the Historical Pre Preservation Committee. Um, I guess I'd like an answer to the question, has the canal company signed off in written approval for the uh, removal of the, the relocation of the canal? Because I guess I'd like to speak a little bit for the... Um, historical values of the canal. Um, when there was some research done on this earlier, I believe it shows up in the early 1900 Sanborn maps. It runs in a diagonal through the property and appears to be on the original path of, you know, the original path the canal would have run through. And I don't think we should minimize sort of the, um, the you know, the consequences of, of moving and relocating one of the earliest historical structures, essentially, in the North End, which is this canal, which dates from the 18, I believe it's the 1860s. Yes, it's, it dates from the 1860s. So this isn't just a ditch. This is, this is, a, this is a, a, something that should be recognized as a significant historical feature. And I would urge the city to also pursue that, that this is something that should be looked at. And, and, and because we're likely to see other, with the you know, massive influx of people with a lot of money building bigger and bigger houses and not being satisfied with the existing structures on site, we're likely to see incidences of, incidents of moving canals again uh, in applications in front of the city. And I guess I too would like to voice just my extreme consternation and sadness at uh, the tree removal and how it played out. And um, really do believe that there needs to be, you know, stronger enforcement of penalties for removal of trees. And I, I would like to just say that, I, that the house that exists there, that it now still exists there, really sort of embodies the North End. And um, all the, the claims of no historical significance, et cetera. 
it's a it was a modest property. This is sort of what the you know large areas of the North End were. And to claim there's no historical significance there makes no sense to me. So that's it. Thanks, Katie. Are you here to testify, sir? No. Welcome back. <laughs> All right. So nobody else in the room is here to testify. We'll go to the <coughs> online people. Madam Mayor, we do have two people that signed up in advance already. Oh, you're right. Yep, we'll start with them. Michael Short and Mitzi, is it Cislac? Is it really 103 degrees outside right now? Wow. It's 40, that's great. Are they there? Oh, great. So, um, Michael and Mitzi, it sounds like your mics are off. I, I hope my mic oh, is on. Okay, now we can hear you, Michael. Thank you. You may go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Members. My name is Michael Short. I currently reside at 1714 West Bannock Street, but I uh, grew up at 707 North 19th Street. I believe the Historic Preservation Committee's denial of these applications should be confirmed. The committee has specific expertise and experience in these matters. They conducted two public hearings on these applications, including input from dozens of community members. Confirming the committee's denial of these applications is supported by the record, by city code, and serves as an important confirmation of the committee's dictate to protect Boise's historical districts. As to the nature of the underlying application, Appellants canal and home removal applications rely on the removal of trees. Mere weeks before the removal of the trees, the appellant's son submitted an application including a tree removal plan right next door. That the appellants did not know of the requirements of the tree removal application challenges belief. In either event, appellants cannot equitably be allowed to proceed with their plans simply because they have already and impermissibly removed those trees. As to the house, this house was never resurveyed when the North End Historic District was created. Its status as non-contributory non should be resurveyed under appropriate standards for that historic district. Boise Code does allow for resurveying, even if that is not the usual policy. When the North End District and other historic districts were created, homes were surveyed or resurveyed, and this did not trigger violations of vested rights. Regardless of the status of the house, the removal of the house is justifiably related to the canal rerouting such that denial of one supports denial of the other. Not only would a new house require the removal of trees, which already happened, but any new house would require a rerouting of a historical integral canal, not just of the property, but the neighborhood and the city of Boise. Canals in Idaho, especially the Treasure Valley, are the story of Idaho itself. Without farmers' cooperatives in the 1880s and the reclamation programs of the early 20th century, Boise as we know it would not exist. The canal through this property is diverted from the Boise River on Warm Springs Avenue. It collects hot spring runoff and flows through significant parts of the North End. This section is unique. When it emerges from below ground onto 717 and its formerly verdant lush property, its waters warm from the hot springs became a haven for local bird and wildlife. While those trees are gone, the canal and its potential can still be protected. Simply put, a 150 year old canal is a distinct historical feature of the North End and should be protected both pursuant to historic preservation standards and for the vibrancy of the neighborhood and city as a whole. Even if demolition of the house is approved as non-contributory, rerouting of the canal would result in destruction of an important historical feature of the North End and should not be approved. Thank you for your time. Oh. Hi, can you hear me? This is Naomi Aiken, can you hear me?
Sorry, guys, my mic wasn't on. Um, I need Lorinda to turn off her mic. Naomi, um, it, we haven't called you yet. And Mitzi, we heard you for a second. So try again. Hi, this is Mitzi. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mitzi C. Slack. I live at 707 North 19th Street. Um, this project strikes to the heart of what it means to live in a historic district. This includes maintaining cohesive neighborhood identity and respect of the unique natural settings of old Boise neighborhoods. The tragic tree removal and proposed alterations to our beloved iconic canal are a devastating blow to the North End. Longtime residents of this neighborhood are quite simply grief stricken. Neighbors drew and wrote messages of sadness on the sidewalk outside of this property for months after the illegal tree removal. The goals and guidelines of historic preservation in this district are clearly stated in multiple documents, and this project contravenes them in the following ways. One, the Interior Secretary's published standards recommends identifying, retaining, and preserving building and landscape features that are important in defining the overall historic character of the setting. It is not recommended to remove or substantially change those building and landscape features in this setting, which are important in defining the historic character. The historic Boise Canal is undeniably important in the culture and history of Boise and this district and should not be altered to allow for new construction. Two, according to the Boise Historic Preservation Plan, when the expanded North End was annexed in 2004, one of the driving forces was that many smaller homes were being torn down to build larger homes that maximize lot coverage. Protection of these modest homes in the North End was deemed essential. Three, the published goals of the North End Historic District state that the most significant features of the district are its overall scale and simple character of buildings and tree-lined streetscape. As a result, the primary goal is preserving the general modest character of each block as a whole as viewed from the street. The proposed alterations to this property will dramatically change the character of this block. Four, Idaho Law Code 67-4608 requires the commission to account for and limit the degree of change in exterior features in a historic district and counsels against moving or altering natural features, which would be incongruous with the historical or cultural aspects of the district. This canal is integral to this neighborhood and this project is wholly incongruous with the historical and cultural aspects of the North End. And finally, five, the existing home has significance in this neighborhood. The home is on the chopping block only on the basis of an outdated 1978 survey, which was done one full year prior to the establishment of the Historic Preservation Commission. It was surveyed for the incorrect historic district with distinctly different overriding policies and goals as stated in the Historic Preservation Guidelines. Other homes in the area were surveyed between 2001 and 2004. Boise City Code does allow for resurvey if it is felt that errors were made in the original survey. This threshold has been clearly met. I want to express my gratitude to the Historic Preservation Commission for the important work that they are doing in protecting our treasured historic districts, and I request that this body uphold their denial of this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mitzi. All right, now we'll move to folks that have raised their hands but didn't sign up in advance. Madam Mayor, our first uh, person is Naomi Adkin. Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for um, meeting on this issue tonight. I do appreciate everybody's time. My name is Naomi Aitken and I live at 813 North 20th Street, um, one block away from the property. Um, just to address some concerns that were, um, or questions that were brought up by the council council previously. Um, it's important for you all to know that the trees were cut before the historic preservation meeting allowed for neighbors to testify to whether or not the home was um, contributing or non-contributing and before the historic preservation Commission could vote on um, the removal of the trees and the destruction of the home. Neighbors were given no opportunity to speak regarding the home. All neighbors that I have spoken with, and it goes on for blocks, um, were opposed to the, to the destruction of the home and to the destruction of the tree. Neighbors feel that the home is contributing. 
Trees appear to have been dropped intentionally on the home. The roof of the home has clearly been destroyed and it does appear to neighbors that um, this was done intentionally in order to uh, contribute to determining that the home was non-contributing and therefore warranting destruction. Um, I am 43 years old and have lived in the North End for the entirety of my life. My parents um, live right across the street from North Junior High <clears throat> on 14th Street, um, right next to North Junior High. <clears throat> Excuse me. We um, clearly uh, have lived in the North End many years prior to it being determined a historic preservation district. Um, many of my neighbors, I'd say 60% of my neighbors, all have owned their homes longer than I've been alive. Um, we all have come before the Historic Preservation Commission for for one reason or another. My dad wanted to put a porch on his home. It was denied and he respected that denial. I had to work a um, complete remodel around an existing tree in my backyard that nobody would have noticed um, had it been cut or not. Um, old North End residents do not have the money to hire lawyers to come before the commission um, or the city council. We are educators, we're bike mechanics, we're um, postal workers, we are secretaries. Those are the homes um, that were occupied. Those were the people that occupied occupied the homes I grew up around. I think that um, having new neighbors move in with means above and beyond those uh, when the Historic Preservation Commission was put in place has changed things and that we need to go back to basics and the city council needs to uphold the rules as they were originally written, regardless of the means um, of new neighbors. New neighbors who are moving in are clearly informed of the regulations. They're informed by realtors, they're informed by architects, they're informed at the time that they close and meet with the title company. There is no excuse and there should be no exception um, to the rules being broken. What, regardless of how long somebody has lived in the community. All animals that used to occupy the canal have been displaced. My neighbors across the street have stated that they have ducks that no longer have nesting areas and they've had to move up the canal for shade. Um, in addition, there has been no approval from the canal company. One of my neighbors hey, is Omi. on the board of the canal company. And just to be clear that there's no approval from the canal company. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate um, you hearing this issue today. Thanks, Naomi. Madam Mayor, our next person is Lauren, Ooh, I'm, excuse me, Lorenda Williams. Okay. Great. Thank you, Madam Mayor and City Council. Um, I will be brief. Um, I grew up, uh, my name is Lorenda Williams. I now reside at 2230 North 27th Street in Boise's North End. I grew up in a house on 906 North 17th, which was two blocks from the canal and the house that is um, now in a state of disrepair. Um, as a little girl, I used to save whatever scraps I could keep out of my lunch, generally my, my sandwich crust and go feed the ducks on my way home from school in that canal 50 years ago, over 50 years ago. Um, I moved back to the North End two years ago because this was an, an area that I had a sense of place and felt that I belonged. It is green, the houses have character and the people generally look out for each other. I'm appealing to you merely on the emotions of the fact that this is a place that I remember with great fondness. Um, I knew the whites that owned the house next door. And uh, I remember when Mrs. White applied for that home to become part of the historic register when I was in high school. Um, I feel a great sadness because I came upon the cut trees uh, during a bike ride last fall and I was absolutely appalled. And um, I was a member of the historic uh, Preservation Committee of Nina um, earlier this year and am a person of record from the testimony on March 30th. I would encourage you to deny 
the demolition and turn down the rerouting of the canal. There are many lovely homes, and I'm sure that the current owners could find a beautiful home that they can afford to purchase. That little cottage was very special, very unique, very small, but it represented the history of Boise when the North End was orchards and small farms and small farmhouses. Thank you. Thanks, Lorinda. Next up. We have Sherry. Um, Sotazo. Yes. Great. Hi, Sherry. Hi, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. This is Sherry Vitazzo. My address is 311 North 23rd Street, and I'm testifying here tonight in support of the appellant. I've testified- Sherry, Sherry you're, could you talk just a little louder? Oh yeah, can you hear me now? A is little bit better. better. Is that, okay, I'll try to project. Um, I, this is Sherry Batazzo. My address is 311 North 23rd Street, and I'm testifying in support of the appellant. I've testified in support of this project a couple of times now, and I'm sure those remarks are on the record, so I'll keep those brief. Initially, I wanted to testify this evening for one main reason, and that was out of concern that the appellant might be viewed by the council through the same lens as the appellant from the December 1st, 2020 hearing, where we testified regarding the illegal demolition that took place at 1521 North 5th Street. I testified there along with others um, who identified the action of that demolition as flagrant and in your face disregard for the law. While the actions of removing multiple mature trees from the site at 717 North 19th without a permit and without going through the proper application process were both shocking and borderline tragic, they were not intended to be egregious in nature. The appellant didn't violate a permit that he had, stating that he couldn't. He violated a historic guideline that he was unaware of, stating that he shouldn't. He testified that this was done based on poor advice he received from a licensed professional tree company. And because the information was not readily available on the city's website to serve as an accessible guideline. I can attest to this fact because back in October, while I was serving on the NINA board, this applicant contacted me after having committed this tragic act and in the wake of shocked and upset neighbors, rightfully so. He requested a conference call with both me and then President Mark Baltus, which we granted. At that time, he explained he was new to the area. He was renting a house in the North End while he remodeled a recent purchase, and he unknowingly committed this violation. In addition to having hired a professional, he searched the city's website for tree removal info and saw nothing about a required certificate in the historic district. While he was on the phone, we also looked at the city's website and could not locate the information. It wasn't contained in the tree section. However, it was layered more deeply in the historic section. The city has since taken actions to make this more clear by improving the, uh, the website and by sending a letter to all residents in historic districts with their December sewer bills. I know I received one and I just want to speak to that because it's so easy to say everyone knew or should have known. And I really do think that this new community member didn't know. Despite the testimony that Michael Short said that he had filled out an application on a different property, all that says is, are you removing a tree of significance? It doesn't actually delve into the fact of whether you can and how you could. In meetings past and before this council, I have testified in opposition to illegal demolitions and have recently taken place in the North and East End historic districts. Each time those applicants presented, it was my experience that none of them showed much for remorse nor value for historic preservation, and none of whom suggested remedies or mitigations to make up for their actions. They barely even acknowledged the impact on the communities in which they lived. In fact, they acted entitled. I think this appellant has acted differently. He's not only acknowledged his mistake, He's made countless efforts to meet and talk with his neighbors and offer solutions that the city has accepted to make up for their actions. He's mm -hmm. presented these. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. That's all. I yield my time. Thanks, Sherry. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, our last person is Melissa Arnold. Great. Hi, Melissa. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, my name's again, my name's Melissa Arnold. My address is 1700 North Harrison. I've been a resident in the North End for two years now. I've been watching the progress on the property and have been following the applications and hearings for about six months now. I'm in favor of the project and I encourage the council to approve the appeal and let it move forward. Uh, first, regardless of whether it 
could, whether the property could have or should have been designated as contributing, it wasn't. The city rec records and files designate the property as non-contributing. The applicants in the case researched the property and relied on the city records and city staff in making a significant investment. It would be fundamentally unfair to treat this home as contributing at this stage after purchasing the property, designing a new home, and filing applications. Citizens should be able to rely on the city's historic information. If the consensus is, is that this information needs to be updated, it should be done on a district-wide level and not while a specific home is under review. Except for an, an initial stumble with the trees, which I believe was unintentional, these applicants have done everything right. It appears they've cooperated with staff at every level. They've listened to neighbors' concerns on daylighting the canal. In my opinion, this relocation is an overall win for neighbors as it will increase the visibility and the length of the feature. They're doing what they can to make amends for the tree removal. The home is a reasonable size on the lot and the design of the home will fit in with the neighborhood. In the end, I believe the proposed project as a whole will have a positive effect on our district. And I'm looking forward to a family living on the property and adding to the fabric of the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there, is there anyone else signed up to testify or waiting to testify? No, Madam Mayor. All right. Any questions for staff at this time? Madam Mayor, um, yeah, I have a question. So as I review the record again, I was thinking I must have missed something. I still can't find any evidence of the uh, Historic Preservation Commission making findings of demolition doesn't mean that they didn't. There was a, a first hearing that I don't believe is part of our record, at least that I can find. And on, find, on page 44 of our record, it specifically has conditions that don't allow uh, the demolition. So I wonder if you could point me to whatever it is I'm missing on those findings. Thanks. Um, Madam Mayor, Council President Clegg, the findings for demolition are in the staff report. Um, I can read them to you. Um, uh, they're at the, it's in the staff report at the end of the packet. So if you go to the end of the packet uh, where the staff. Uh, so, so not just the list of what the findings might be, but is there evidence that the Historic Preservation Commission found on those, on at least three of them? Um, uh, Madam Mayor, Council President Clegg, yes, the commission um, acknowledged that the the property was non-contributing, and and acknowledged that <clears throat> the building does not meet or cannot reasonably reasonably meet state or local criteria. Um, now, on the non-contributing status, it was acknowledged that the property is in fact non-contributing. We have a document that says it's non-contributing. However, in their, in their decision, they questioned whether it's truly non-contributing and asked the applicant to have the property resurveyed. Okay. But we do have the findings in here. The findings are addressed as they normally are in any staff report. Um, and so uh, the commission did, did acknowledge the non-contributing status and did acknowledge the findings, but put into question that the property is truly non-contributing. Okay, that's my confusion because in their motion, during the hearing, they did not address that. Um, Madam Mayor, Council President Clegg, right. They did not, uh, the motion was just one motion for the entire package in this case. Um, it might've been cleaner to do separate motions for each aspect of the project. But in this case, the, op, the, the commission did just do a uh, one motion for the entire project and just uh, denied the entire thing. Okay, thank you. Madam, Madam Mayor. Mayor. Um, Ted, this is kind of a follow on to Elaine's question. There seems to be some confusion about what a property being surveyed for historic contributing status means and who decides that. Um, we had a couple of folks who testified who said the neighbors think that it should be contributing. Can you give us a little bit more context around who does those surveys, how they happen, when they happen, um, and how a uh, how a home or a structure is determined to be contributing or non-contributing. Yes, um, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Member Whittings, 
Uh, so um, when a historic district is proposed, the, one of the first steps you do is you hire a consultant to survey uh, the properties within that boundary. So they visit each of the properties <clears throat> and make a determination whether that property is contributing or not. They can't go on the property, but so they have to make an analysis kind of from the right of way. Um, so, and part of that analysis, uh, so this is an architectural historian typically that is hired by the city to make these individual analysis on, on these properties. And basically they, they, did, they try to determine has the house changed over time since it was constructed? Has it changed outside of the period of significance, which runs roughly to about 1949? Um, has it been altered in some way that would make it unrecognizable from, from when it was constructed? Um, and so those surveys, they, they compiled those surveys into individual documents. And then those surveys are actually sent to the State Historic Preservation Office to be evaluated and approved by the State Historic Preservation Office. Once those are all approved, reviewed and approved by the state, they're brought back to us and you know, public hearings are held for the district. But the survey is done by a, by a consultant hired by the city uh, to determine the contributing or non-contributing status. And those surveys are done typically a year or so prior to the historic district being created. And Mayor, can I just have one follow up? So Ted, if if somebody believes that their neighborhood should be resurveyed, that something has perhaps changed since the first time that the historic district was created, um, is there a process to go about doing that? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Woodings, um, so certainly there is a way to propose to come to the city to propose that. So it, it has been uh, brought to our attention, um, you know, that some of our historic districts have talked about resurveying properties because the surveys are um, becoming a bit dated. Um, so this is something that would be proposed to the city. And I think this the city council would need to approve a resurvey project for um, for a an entire district for a house on its own that would come before the historic preservation commission uh what would be called a classification hearing so if it's on an individual property it's just to the historic preservation commission if it's for an entire district uh, obviously the the city council would need to approve that great thank you so much for walking us through that process a little bit more Vladimir, i think i've got three questions that are related um, so question, first question is really about the canal and if we have documentation that they got approval to pipe or move the canal, or if it was just as somebody, I think said, a, a verbal, okay, over the phone. Uh, Madam mayor, council member, Holly Burton, um, we do not have anything in writing for approval to tile or to relocate the canal. Uh, in our uh, recommendation, in our, we do have a condition of approval that something in writing be provided by the canal company prior to any permits being obtained for that property. Um, but the applicant uh, has, we've talked to the applicant and they have been in contact, they say, with the canal company and have re received verbal approval uh, to, to tile or relocate. But um, again, we do have a condition of approval that nothing can be done on that property until we receive something in writing from the Boise Canal Company. And then, so the second question there is, if the canal company gives approval to the landowner to either tile or reroute the canal, do we, as a city council or a planning department, do we have the ability to say, no, you can't do that, even if the canal company says, yes, you can. Um, Madam Mayor, Council Member Halliburton, um, to reroute a canal in a historic district does require a certificate of appropriateness application, which would go before the you know, Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, on a non-contributing property, we did look at reviewing this administratively because the property is considered non-contributing. So it does require an application it doesn't it wouldn't necessarily come all the way to the city council for that approval but it certainly comes to the city uh, for review so if we and then the final question madam mayor um so if we 
decided to uphold the decision of the commission, would that mean that they would be denied the canal, um, would be denied the permit for the canal, and then also denied the demolition of the house? And since they've already done the trees and there's a mitigation plan that's in place, that would stay the same, but the other two would be not be able to be changed. The canal would have to stay as is and the house wouldn't be allowed to be demoed. Is that what the decision we would be making would be? Um, Madam Mayor, Council Member Halley Purton, that's correct. Okay. Further questions? All right. Matt Mayor, Council, Jeff Bauer again, 601 West Bannock. Um, I'll try to be brief. We agree with Ms. Henwood. We think education is key on this issue. And I appreciate Ms. Patazzo's comments. I do truly believe this, this was a mistake uh, by my client for the tree removal. Um, today in preparing for this hearing, I did get on the city's uh, historic preservation website. And I can say that um, in the future, I don't think anyone will have ignorance as a defense. There's now videos on tree removal as well as um, just the historic uh, preservation process in general. So I would commend city staff and whoever on those videos. Um, we're not trying to maximize lot coverage. Uh, we have 66% open space on our lot, which exceeds the standards. Um, we agree that the code provides recourse to the city to address demolitions or construction that's not uh, properly permitted, but we do not believe denial of this application is the city's recourse. As Mr. Venegas and uh, uh, Mr. Riddle mentioned, there's a separate code enforcement process to address that. Also agree with Mr. Klinger, uh, ignorance of the law is no defense. As a lawyer, uh, it's kind of the first thing they teach you. Um, but I would say I've, I've watched this council's decisions on these projects recently, and I know that I think all of you have made a distinction between willful ignorance and, and willful uh, actions knowing the rules versus mistake. And again, I think we have a mistake here. Uh, Mr. Venegas properly uh, recited the facts with respect to the canal. We do have uh, verbal approval. Our engineers, SPF, have been working with the canal company to approve the relocation. Uh, and the condition of approval in this project does require written approval before we can make any changes. Uh, Mr. Halliburton, great questions. Um, it's actually a kind of a rabbit hole I went down. Uh, if the canal company was actually a state entity, uh, this the historic preservation laws could not regulate it. If the canal company wanted to change it, they could. In this case, it's a cooperative, so they are governed by the regulations. But uh, at one other interesting point, the certificate of appropriateness decision, decision matrix provides that in-ground irrigation facilities are not subject to regulation. We didn't bring that up tonight because I don't think it's relevant because we meet the standards, but um, that is an argument that could potentially be made. Mr. Short, great comments, and I appreciate uh, the history. Uh, real quick, there were two hearings on this. Uh, the first one was tied. That's why I went to a second one. At the second hearing, the decision was 3-5, so this was close. You don't owe the Historic Preservation Commission any deference. You owe them what's called due consideration per your code. Due consideration, quote, is not deference. It simply means the degree of attention properly paid to something as the circumstances merit. Based on all the errors that we've articulated here, I don't think any deference is merited. On a certificate of appropriateness application, again, we would argue that we're entitled to rely as a vested right on the survey. Uh, shortly after our application at the Historic Commission, their attorney provided them with an almost hour-long presentation about how to make findings and about the Historic Preservation Regulations. She agreed with our position, and, and she kind of summed it up nicely in a quote. Quote, the idea is you don't get to change the rules of the game mid-game. That's pretty much what we're presenting here tonight. Uh, Council Member Woodings, I agree with everything that was stated in terms of the ability of the city to reclassify properties. They can do it on an individual basis 
or on a district wide basis, just not while there's one pending. I think that's all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for your time, but I would stand for any questions. I think they're good. Thank you. Thank you. That I'll close the hearing. Madam Mayor, I'm going to attempt a motion in this multi-part mess. Um, I would move to grant the appeal in DRH 2112 and 2117 by reversing with respect to the demolition and by reversing and modifying with respect to the trees and by reversing and modifying with respect to the canal. And then if I get a second, I can explain what those modifications are. Second. So this is a, a mess. Um, and for people watching and paying attention, our job here is to sort out what to do with it, not to make a decision based on what should have been done the first time around. That's punishment and retribution. And that's not what we do. That's what our code enforcement does. Recently, we had one of these, um, and I think it was unclear how the code enforcement process went afterwards, but I hope that the code enforcement and the prosecution team doesn't draw any inferences from our decision here tonight as to what they should do. That's their job, that's their lane, and I'm sure that they will proceed properly within their line in those ways. So I would reverse the denial of the tree condition approval on the ground that it violated state law and Boise city code, excuse me, city law and the city code, because it didn't provide a reason statement or justification. And that's one of the grounds for reversal. Additionally, and this is a little more frustrating, the only practical thing achieved by the denial, given that the trees have all been cut, is that we have no control over how to get more trees there again. So by granting the appeal and reversing with respect to the trees, we can then modify the order or modify the condition to require tree mitigation on behalf of um, of the residents of that neighborhood. And so what I would propose in this motion is that the applicant appellant coordinate and work with city staff to produce an acceptable tree mitigation plan in time for us to review at our August 3rd city council meeting. Um, and I would kind of hint we don't have an August 3rd city council. There's no August 3rd. At, uh, at the meeting of one week after our non August 3rd city council meeting. I want, I'd like to see it happen promptly. Upon the adjournment, you guys are out. I think August 17th is our first one, maybe. August 17th, city council meeting. <laughs> um, it would be good if it happened promptly. And if we can get it before then, I'm sure we'd consider it. Um, and I would hint that I think what the council would like to see would be four to six inch caliper trees and 15 feet of height to try to create that screen that was there, but then it got removed. And I would also encourage exploring things like the city of trees challenge or other citywide tree mitigation plans to offset what happened here. With respect to the canal, I would reverse and then modify that decision on the ground that the decision about the canal was not supported by substantial evidence because the canal relocation did meet every applicable standard that we have. Um, I would modify it by conditioning any further or future permitting on the work on the job site to written approval from the canal company of the plan. Um, no telephone calls, no oral agreements, no continuing meaningful work there without written confirmation that the canal company is on board. And then with respect to the demolition, I would just reverse that because uh, the decision that the Historical Preservation Commission made was arbitrary and capricious. It was arbitrary and capricious because that body acknowledged that at least three of the conditions were met. And in my review, I see that they were met and yet issued a denial anyway. So when you have somebody meeting the criteria and you reject them anyway, that's arbitrary. Um, the conditions that I see are that the structure is classified as non-contributing. Um, that is how it is presently classified and without getting into whether the applicant has a property right or whether they you know, justifiably relied on their status, it's certainly true that the code says, look at how it is classified, not how it should be classified. Um, there's no evidence, this is the second condition that the existing structure is eligible for designation as a historic property. We haven't seen that evidence. The commission didn't see that evidence. And so lacking that, that's a reason to grant the demolition. And then third, there's no evidence that the existing structure, uh, that, that its demolition will not have an adverse impact on the district. And that's again, because it's classified as non-contributing. Uh, 
brief comment on the idea that the applicant should have a burden to reclassify their own property. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, it's wrong because it would functionally make it so that all of our classifications don't matter. Anytime anybody wants to demolish a property, they need to go get their property reclassified. That's that, that it would undo the purpose of all of our maps. Um, and it's wrong sort of from a fairness perspective because you're asking an applicant to argue against themselves at their own expense, despite what our own sandboard maps say. So those are the reasons that uh, I would reverse, reverse and modify and reverse and modify. Madam Mayor. Um, I'll, um, I'd like to comment on the motion. I, as much as I um, agree with some of the commenters that the loss of the trees without a, an appropriate certificate is a tremendous loss to the city. I think you all know how much I care about trees. In this case, I think Council Member Bajan is right that uh, denying a certificate of appropriateness puts us in a position of not being able to do anything about that loss. And um, providing a certificate um, puts us in a position to do quite a lot about it. In terms of the canal, I also um, agree that it's great to have this little piece of Boise left. However, we need to acknowledge that through the rest of the North End, there's really only by my recollection, uh, having walked quite a lot of that area, only three places where it surfaces, which means it's been covered in the rest of its distance. And to now say that because there's only these few paces left that this property owner has to be treated differently and not be allowed to change the canal when all other property owners were allowed to, um, just doesn't meet the uh, any, fairness in my mind, um, nor does it meet it in the law as I understand the law. And finally, on the contributing versus non-contributing, I agree with uh, Council Member Bajan that you can't retroactively change the rules. It'd be like saying, well, um, we're not going to allow this because it really shouldn't be zoned R1. It should be zoned something else. Or we're not going to allow this because we're going to change the rules before we make our decision. Uh, it may be that um, the surveys are dated and we need to reconsider it, uh, but that has to be done prior to any applications and not after. Um, if this motion passes, I'd like um, a bit of time at the end to propose that we address this more universally going forward as well. Madam Mayor, um, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that's been said so far, um, especially I was going to bring up Council President Clegg's comment at the end about looking at this more universally. We've had so many Historic Preservation Commission appeals um, that really call a lot of our actions into question a lot of the education that realtors are provided and contractors in this case um, are provided around permitting and um, how you have to treat things differently in a historic preservation district. Um, so I think that we have a lot to do there. We have a lot of clarity to build. Um, actually, Cody and I were just talking about this a couple of days ago when our um, when our PDS department is staffed up again and we have a little bit more capacity to have those conversations, we very much look forward to doing it, doing so, um, so that we can provide more clarity so that we can get back on the same page about what we all envision for our historic districts going forward as our city grows um, and as we have changing needs for families and that type of thing. So um, I'm happy to support the motion. I think that out of fairness to the property owner, um, this is the best course of action and also to get the caliper inches that we need from trees um, and make sure that this property is again contributing to the neighborhood. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Um, I absolutely agree with everything that's been said. I do have a question for um, Councilmember Bajant, maker of the motion, um, just because 
throughout some of our discussion here, it sounds like maybe there, maybe I might just need a little bit more clarity. So when we're talking about specifically the canal, uh, we're talking about getting a proper certificate of appropriateness, and we're talking about getting written confirmation from the canal company um, saying that we're doing this. And are we also asking them to do indeed reroute the canal and not tile the canal? Or are you are we leaving that open to be to be tiled? I hadn't thought about it, sir. I think um, the applicant initially wanted to tile it. The applicant was open to leaving it open at the neighbor's request. Um, and uh, I, I suppose I don't have strong feelings. If you, if you do, we should discuss them. Uh, Madam Mayor, I guess my, my feelings would be to honor the historic na nature of the neighborhood as much as possible that we do, in fact, try to leave the canal open. Uh, if the seconder is okay, let's amend the modification of the canal condition to say, you know, reverse with respect to rerouting the canal, uh, condition all future permits on written confirmation that, uh, that the proper permission from the canal company has been received, um, and that whatever happens with the canal, it remain open and not be tiled. Seconder yeah. concurs. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Um, thank you to Councilman Bajet for teasing that apart enough so that we could move forward with something. Um, I, I, I guess I have a question for staff and um, I don't know if it's something that's happening already or as Council Member Wooding said, perhaps when we increase our staff, they'll have more capacity to do this. But I ran into my brother here a couple of years ago. He works for a, a home development company and he was here getting training for erosion prevention as part of his work. Um, do we offer that sort of training like, like lawyers get, continuing education opportunities so that they're up to date on changes in code and that sort of thing? So that, so that an applicant could trust uh, when they're interacting with a vendor and they ask, do I need a permit for this? Do we need a permit for this? Um, Madam Mayor, Council Member Sanchez, we don't currently have that in place, but it is something that we have discussed a lot um, within our department and with um, the mayor and a couple of council members, as well as, as implementing a certification program. So it is something that we've, um, really investigated, researched, and looked at, um, but it just uh, hasn't been implemented yet. So currently we do not have that. Thanks. All right, Clerk, I'm gonna ask you to call the roll. Hallie Burton. Yes. Sanchez. Yes. Thompson. Yes. Woodings. Yes. Agent. Yes. Clegg. Yes. All in favor, motion carries. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, I'd like to ask my unanimous consent from my fellow council members for uh, myself and council member Bajent to work with staff on two things we have talked about for some time but not taken final action on. The first is uh, the penalty section of the Historic Preservation District's uh, chapter and um, describing something that um, provides a penalty for willfully acting without a certificate of approval. And the second is to um, finalize the discussions we've had on uh, tree removal in general on private property and appropriate mitigation for those and bring something forward to the council at a work session on both those issues as soon as possible. Without objection. All righty, it's settled, as long as Patrick doesn't object. Well, I didn't object, so Lane, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I would move we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we're adjourned. Have a good night, everybody.